Good afternoon. Um, the Committee on Environment, Revenue, and Taxation Procurement is calling this virtual confirmation hearing to order um, at one o'clock. It's Monday, July 13, 2020. And followed by the confirmation hearing, we'll be having a joint hearing uh, with uh, Senator Therese Terlahi, um, um, who's the chair for the Committee on Health, Tourism, Historic Preservation, Land and Justice. Um, so to begin, uh, first of all, uh, the notice of after this afternoon's virtual hearing was provided to senators, stakeholders, and local media on July 7th to meet the five-day notice and July 9th, uh, 2020, to meet the 48-hour notice, thus meeting the requirements of open government law. I would like to thank and acknowledge my, my colleagues that have joined me here today. Um, thank you to Senator Therese Terlahi. Uh, thank you to Senator Kelly marsh Titano, And thank you to Senator Bill Castro. Uh, the purpose of this first part of the hearing is the confirmation hearing, is to receive testimony on the executive appointment of Mr. Stephen R. Hollister to serve as a member of the Guam Environmental Protection Agency Board of Directors. The committee will continue to receive testimony until 4 p.m. Monday, July 20, 2020. Um, please address the testimony to Senator Sabina Flores Perez, Chairperson of the Committee on Environment, Revenue, Taxation, Procurement, or it can be dropped off at the mailboxes of the legislature or emailed to office at senatorparis.org. So the rules of the conduct for this virtual public hearing is the host of the hearing will mute all participants until called upon by the chair. A virtual background should not be utilized during the hearing and participants must be visible at all times. Uh, when called to speak, please ensure that you're unmuted and that you're speaking into your microphone. Uh, members of the committee wishing to speak may indicate their desire to the chair through an in-app in chat feature. Uh, the order of questioning will be in the order of the request. A uh, line of questions will begin with the chairs and upon completion of the questioning, the chairs will open up to the, the floor to the other members. Uh, individuals testifying shall be first recognized by the chair before speaking and they shall state their name for record keeping purposes. Uh, questions and testimony shall be confined to the substance or nature of the agenda. Uh, personal inference as to the character or the motive of any senator or any individual testifying is not permitted. And any violations of this general rule of conduct will result in removal from the public hearing by the host. So to begin our agenda, um, the first item is the executive appointment of Mr. Stephen R. Hollister to serve as a member of the Guam Environmental Protection Agency Board of Directors. Um, I would like to, uh, first of all, uh, invite those who have come to testify uh, on behalf of the nominee. So I do believe we have several members from Guam EPA, as well as a member of uh, the chairperson of the board, Guam EPA board. Um, so I would like to first um, allow the agency, uh, wh whoever is here to to present or all of the above. I, I see, I wanna acknowledge uh, the presence of uh, Administrator Walter Leon Guerrero, half a day. Half a day. And also the Public Information Officer, Nick Ripley is also present with us today, half a day. And then Bob Perron, who is the chairman. So if I could like to invite uh, Guam EPA to provide their testimony first. Thank you, Senator Perez. Um, so I'd, I'd like to speak on behalf of, uh, or for uh, Mr. Steve Hollister, who's been a current board member for uh, Guam EPA, board, part of the board of directors for Guam EPA. Uh, so first off, uh, I, when he was proposed to come into our board, I did not know much about Mr. Hollister, or Director Hollister, excuse me. And uh, I've, during our meetings, I've, I've got to know more about him. He's He's, as, as he could explain uh, more about himself, he, he's a teacher, he works for a high school. Um, and what I really appreciate from Mr. Uh, Director Hollister is he will listen to the things that we do at Palm EPA based on, the, on our board. Um, and if he's not sure, he is not afraid to ask. I know that in other boards, I've seen people just, it's, it's uh, quiet, they go through the board meeting and then they're done. Um, the thing about our board is they are not like that. They are very inquisitive. They wanna know what's going on. They wanna know the reasons for doing things. Mr. Hollister, excuse me again, Director Hollister 
it's definitely along those lines. Um, he asked a lot of questions and they're all good. Um, sometimes you may not be in agreement with what we're doing, which is fine. That's what the board is supposed to do. So why I'm endorsing Director Hollins here is he's not just someone that's a yes and let's move on. He really is in tune, trying to get in tune with our agency. He wants to do what's right for the island of Guam and the people of Guam. And so with that, I'll keep it short. He's, he's a valued member uh, for our board. And I hope that uh, you guys confirm him to, to remain on. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, Walter. Um, at this time, I'd like to recognize uh, Mr. Ripley. Are you here to present a testimony? Oh, so you need to unmute. Hi, good afternoon, Senators. Uh, no, I'm just here in uh, general support for uh, uh, Director Hollister. Okay, well, thank you, Nick. Um, nice to see you. Uh, and then we also have Chairperson Bob Perrin. Um, do you like? Good afternoon, Senator. Yeah, I'd like to say a few words in support of Director Hollister. Yeah, Steve Hollister, whoops. You can show um, a visual. Okay, there it is. Oops, let me get in the shot there. Okay, there we go. Okay, you got it now, Senator? Looks good. Okay, okay, yeah. Steve Hollister has been with the Guam Environmental Protection Agency for five plus years. During that time, he's been active in pushing for solutions to the illegal dumping problem, as well as bringing to the, agents, the agency's attention examples of erosion and other runoff into Guam's waters. He's been a very involved member of the board, coming to the meetings prepared and doing outside study to become more familiar with the issues affecting Guam's environment. He is also a school teacher, as Walter mentioned, which allows him to educate students on the environment and to bring their concerns forward as well. For these reasons, I wholeheartedly recommend that Mr. Steve Hollister be reconfirmed as a member of the Guam Environmental Protection Agency Board of Directors. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Perman. Um, and so now um, we would like to invite the nominee to provide testimony. Uh, Steve, yeah, you can, you, would, you can, you have to unmute, unmute yourself. Okay. Okay. Hello everyone. And good afternoon. Thank you for being here. Anyways, um, as Bob and Walter said, uh, yeah, I, I, I love the environment and I love the outdoors. I'm an avid hiker. Um, I care about the culture and uh, Guam has been awesome to me. And uh, I want for my kids and everybody else, I want them to experience Guam the way I did and trying to keep it, um, you know, uh, clean and, and uh, go after, you know, keep it, uh, keep the environment the way it is. And, um, and uh, if not improve it. And uh, yeah, I, you know, um, I'll take any questions if you have, but I do, and both uh, Mr. Leon Guerrero and uh, Mr. Perrin, I, I do care about the island and I do care about uh, the environment a great deal. And it's not just our Thursday meetings, it's every day I care about it. So um, as, uh, I think you probably wanna know about conflict of interest. I don't have those. Um, my friend, the people I know who are businessmen and have businesses on island, know me and if they mess up, they know that I am not going, you know, I'll stay true to my character and, and um, you know, I won't let them slide, so to say, so. Um, okay, um, good. you're good. Okay, so uh, thank you for that. I just, um, I guess we were gonna ask uh, some questions and I'll open it up to the floor. Uh, so Steve, um, the administrator talked about there was some perhaps a disagreement that occurred and um, can you explain uh, what happened at that point? What was, what was the disagreement about uh, and how was it resolved? Well, the one, the one, uh, one of them that I can think of is uh, the wording when we were uh, uh, change or trying to figure out the wording for the um, revolving recycling fund thing and um, how, I remember when it was presented to the community that it was presented as a way to get the junk cars off the island. And um, 
the but we were changing that to um in for different wording and have it up to the discretion of epa what to use the money for as far as recycling removing uh, white goods or cars and i just didn't think that was um, i didn't think i am sorry um uh, i didn't think that was uh proper because the way it was sold to the public first was just to remove cars and um, uh, how was it resolved um, um Mr. Uh, Leon Guerrero assured me that cars are priority and then other things fall in line after that. So it was, just, I think it was a, more of a misunderstanding on my part. And uh, so that's one example. Okay. Um, the other, I guess another question is, um, you know, what do you think are the biggest threats to the environment these days? And, you know, how do you see your role on the board uh, to kind of uh, address those challenges? Okay. Um, well, number one, the climate change. We're on an island and we can't afford that. Um, my house in Agate is 11 feet above sea level. So I'm concerned about that. Um, I'm uh, concerned about our, our, um, our dump uh, and overfilling and being filled up too quickly. Uh, illegal dumping. Um, the actual land use. Um, I've been in places where there are, and my folks actually still live in a place called Eagle Mountain and it's being overrun by developers and it's totally destroying the environment or the, the one I knew growing up where I hunted and fished and camped. You can't do that there anymore. I'm worried about that kind of stuff going on on Guam. And did you ask for a solution? Is that what you were asking? I, I'm address it, I guess, on the board, well, you know, what is your role you feel in addressing those issues or how can you oh, address them? all those issues? Uh, well, for one, like I said, I'm a hiker and I'm outside all the time and I, I take notice of what's going on and I'll report that. Um, and so just as a, a, a private individual seeing something, um, I, I'll bring it to the attention of uh, one of the guys at EPA or somebody else, like I did with you the other day. Um, I, uh, on as far as the board goes and my role on it, punish, protect, but then people who mess up, companies who mess up, hold them accountable and do what we can to, um, to, uh, to make sure it doesn't happen again. Uh, but again, with the environment, it's hard because once it's messed up, it's very hard to um, uh, get it back. Um, um, and then what is your position? So there's um, a lot of like super fun sites uh, that are related to the military. Um, right. What is uh, your position on, on um, holding them accountable? Oh, no, we got to. I think they um, have gotten away with too much in the past. Um, and um, I remember Northwest Field when I, I was looking out uh, from uh, my high school and I could see where they had uh, dumped stuff off the end of the cliff there all the way um, uh, from my high school. I could, I could see the, the white, you know, the, where they just dumped uh, the debris and trash, or not trash, but dirt and rocks over the cliff. And it scarred the cliff and that, that made me mad. Um, but yes, no, I, the military has got to be held accountable um, and we can't let them run over us. Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you, Steve. Um, so I'd like to open up the floor to my colleagues, uh, Senator Therese Terlahi. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you to Mr. Hollister for your willingness to accept this uh, appointment again. How long have you been serving on this board? I've been going to meetings for five years. Uh, serving on the board um, is, I, I believe, it's over two years now as official. But I've been I've been sitting on a, in on the meetings for before I was appointed to the board. All right. Well, I reviewed the attendance records for the past couple of years and your attendance seems very good. There's only maybe one or two meetings that you missed. So I want to thank you for your for that and your participation as the director described 
uh, in the meetings. I think that's very important that we have uh, board members who are willing to participate as much as possible. Do you believe that the agency, and I want to say hi to the director and to Nick Rupley and of course the chairperson Peron, but do you believe the agency is doing um, enough for um, um, to address the the issues that we have going on Guam? Well, uh, great question. W one of the things I'm frustrated with is that because of rules and laws, the way I don't think we can do enough. We're not doing enough. We, we do what we can. But when it comes down to the fining part and holding people accountable or companies accountable, they might create, you know, millions of dollars worth of damage and then get a $10,000 fine because that's the limit of what we can do. Um, and, and so that, that bothers me. Um, uh, and one of the things I, 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 I speak about sometimes when I, when I started the Guam EPA, EPA environmental protection agency, that's everything in the environment. And I've come to find out that different agencies have different roles in protecting. I mean, I, I understood they had different roles in protecting the environment, but I thought we could step in and do anything anywhere, but then it's, you know, someone else's responsibility, um, with the, you know, the invasive species and things like that. And um, that can be frustrating. And I wish we had more, if anything, I wish we had more ability to uh, address uh, more, uh, more of the environmental uh, problems we have, other than testing the water, runoff, air pollution, and things like that. Yes, I know that the agency has a very wide mandate a broad mandate and they, they do a lot of work and very good work. Uh, my, yeah, I am also concerned that uh, there are just gaps that we, you know, or we're just not able to get to everything and they're becoming bigger and bigger. So I'm glad to see the agency progress on the rules and regs for the, um, uh, you know, the cars and uh, the recycling revolving fund. That's good. I hope you can hold them accountable to get that, you know, implemented as quickly as possible. We're hearing from the mayors, it's taking a while, but uh, yeah, uh, speed is also an issue, right? And then um, the agency participated with the US EPA on the testing of the, uh, for Agent Orange on Guam or herbicide use. And I wanna commend them for that, for their perseverance in that. Um, but I also, yeah, so, Fines, I agree. So in the back end, the punishment is, um, we may need to look at that further um, so that you're not, you know, um, prevented from, from really holding people accountable. But I, and I want to commend you for your conferences that the EPA has had, because I think they've done a lot to educate the community uh, on the different ways that we are going to prevent this in the first place for, and, and, you know, we've come a long way, I think in um, educating the community as to, as to things that could be done. And I've seen them do things that just didn't work because of theft and other, other issues. But, but uh, yeah, I think um, the community does look at Guam EPA as if they should be responsible for very many things. Yeah. Um, Every site on Guam, they, they think you can control and, and stop the dumping, stop the um, erosion, stop all those things. Uh, do you think, um, what, would you, what would you add more resources to, uh, if you, I guess, Mr. Hollister, if you could, what would you had, add more resources to or put more priority in? Okay, priority. Um, maybe the outreach to the schools uh, for the kids, um, the, the enforcement of the illegal dumping. I know those guys, I think someone's, I think uh, they were telling me there's only three of them to patrol that kind of stuff. Um, uh, and other um, resources. Maybe in um, lobbying y'all to um, make uh, everyone who owns a home on Guam, uh, you have to have trash service. Uh, that would, that, you know, uh, that might be 
what we could put our resources in. Um, another one for helping out uh, recyclers with um, crushing gr a, a glass crusher, uh, ending the, the plastic, the pet bottles on Guam, you're finding something else to use besides that. Um, all right, appreciate those thoughts, and I and I again I want to thank EPA and I. One of the one of the best things I think that occurred this term, a legislative term, was uh, a roundtable that we had on the illegal dumping, mm. and I thought that EPA came very prepared with uh, solutions, alternatives, and um, plans to to implement and to take care of that. Uh, Walter, while you're here, the director, can I just ask, are are your minutes online? <laughs> yeah, thank you, Senator. They should be they should be put um, posted on our website as um, as dictated by law. And um, uh, the person who is supposed to be listed up there is Nick. So Nick, if you can chime in and um, on where they could find it. Yes, Nick. Hi, good afternoon, Senator. Yes, uh, we're pending uh, the, the minutes from our most recent meeting. Um, that will, once, once the board approves that in the next meeting, uh, they'll go up on our website. Um, sorry, Nick, just a reminder if you can show uh, as you're speaking. I, I'm unable to, it says unable to start video. Uh, okay, one moment. Okay, well. That's fine. Um, oh, thanks. Hi, Nick. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. Just to recap, um, our minutes are available on our transparency tab on the website. Uh, the only one that is pending is the June meeting. Um, once those minutes are approved in our July meeting, uh, they will go up on our website. All right. Thank you very much. Again, thank You're you, welcome. Mr. Officer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to add that uh, I believe Guam EPA is, is updating their fine schedule. I believe that's something that was on the priority list, um, you know, after the Safe Drinking Water Act. Um, they, this is one of the top priorities. So that's good to hear that you guys are making uh, some, some pro progress in that. Uh, in regards to the um, universal trash collection, that's something my office is working on to, to put. So I'm looking forward to your um, your um, you know, support. Okay, so um, so I would like to now uh, offer the floor to Senator Marsh Titano for any questions um, of the nominee. Good afternoon, for everybody being here and for having this process take place. It's an important aspect of what we do to be able to hear whether there has been success as a, a board member um, and to hear the vision, goals, uh, uh, participation, and those sort of things. So I really appreciate this opportunity. And from what I've heard thus far, um, it seems that things are positive and that we're hearing the things that we need to that provide us assurance. And so I thank you for your dedication already. And um, if everything continues to go forward for your continued participation. Um, Let's see, and part of what came up, it gets to, uh, to a degree of what we're gonna go into after this, but you had mentioned that we have to hold everybody accountable. It's businesses, it's the military, and, and sometimes that gets a little lost perhaps, or people become a little unsure about what that means. And really for a government, it should be about protection. And so it's good to hear that you have a strong stance on, just protection, protection of uh, what are our resources and what need to serve our community to keep them healthy and to keep our environment healthy, which adds into it so many ways. Um, and I realize it's not always an easy task, but I appreciate your being strong in those roles. So I didn't have any questions per se, but I just wanted to be able to comment that I have appreciated what I've been hearing thus far and I've appreciated the other questions uh, that help us get to understanding you a bit better. So just Maasi, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, just Maasi, Senator Marsh Titano. Uh, Senator Will Castro, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just one second here. 
First of all, congratulations and thank you for accepting. It's good to have a fellow educator on the EPA board uh, to kick us off. You you had me at schools or classrooms, uh, but I do want to state for the record, uh, Commissioner, that I share the sentiments of my colleagues with respect to the big picture items in terms of redressing those issues, those crimes against the community. So I look forward to your active voice uh, in holding those accountable who've polluted uh, the island over the decades. Um, but I am curious in terms of moving forward on what you are mentioning in terms of illegal dumping and littering. Uh, like you, I, I believe that the long-term key uh, is gonna be cultivating a generation of learners, of uh, people whose social consciousness is heightened. And the way to do that is through curriculum and, and bringing that into the school system. Um, I'm not sure about all the programs that exist, you know that we have programs like Coastal Cleanup and we have service learning requirements for our young graduates. So hopefully we can take a more active role as educators to kind of drive policy in that direction so we can get a new generation of folks to just stop littering and throwing stuff out of their cars. Uh, but also, Mr. Commissioner, I want to encourage you and your board members, you know, I, I, I can make it real for us. I'm sure you've seen this, uh, unfortunately. But in the, for example, the Saigon and Nansen area, in Dededo, uh, I've I've helped clean up that park several times, and and uh, what what really what's really hurtful is that you see entire households uh, illegally dumping right there in their backyard. And uh, I'm not certain if it's CLTC properties or or their private properties or they're one and the same. But but my point would be we have to take a more aggressive stance as a community to hold these people accountable. And I don't know what the balance is because you know if if people are dumping in their backyard and their social consciousness is calloused either because they can't afford to dump it elsewhere or something's just materially wrong with the fabric of that community to allow that to occur right there. I, I think that's gonna be a challenge for you, uh, educator, and I really wanna uh, encourage you to look at that with your colleagues. Uh, this is a problem that's been longstanding and I'm hoping that you can bring some innovative approach to it. I, I'm not gonna leave you with just the problems. I wanna encourage you to look at some of the programs that I think uh, may be working in the community. Similarly, in the village of Humatak, uh, you do have those families who can't afford uh, your basic services, but Mayor Bada, uh, to my surprise, you know, and I think this is something that could be replicated. He has a unique program where if you, you can't afford these trash services or you need to borrow equipment, what he does is he lends out the bush cutters or he sends his uh, staff with the trailer to pick up the trash in exchange for community service. And so my point would be um, to secure my vote. You, you, have my, um, you have my vote of confidence at this point in time, but my sustained support for both the EPA and your, your directorship is, is gonna be found in your ability to move us forward and be innovative with these solutions. Cause I don't think it's, um, it's just society's problem. I think it's not definitely not just the government's problem. Uh, but I think you're on the right track of looking at us as a community, as individual learners, starting with our school system. And so I was encouraged and inspired by that statement. Uh, and I encourage you to look in that direction. Um, also, I'm sure you're aware that DSP has a planner symposium um, and the university has a, a center for island sustainability that you can partner with. And so thank you so much for accepting this tall task and, and uh, coming before the legislature from time to time to be able to hear our criticisms and offer up solutions for your consideration uh, as an entire board. And so thank you again for accepting and agreeing to serve. Thank you, Senator Castro. And I just wanna thank uh, Stephen, uh, Mr. Hollister for your continued commitment to serve on the board. I know in the near past, um, it was very difficult to meet quorum and that had serious implications for uh, the regulator, uh, EPA's regulation uh, over uh, violators. And, um, you know, your commitment to stay on the board and continue to serve, I think, is really important. In addition to, I, I really feel that your the environmentalist um, blood runs through your veins. And, you know, I thank you for that. And I thank you that you're, you know, you want to, you know, promote this stewardship to our, ne our, our next generation, which is really important. So, uh, thank you for, for taking the time and uh, for being part of the EPA board uh, and seeing this as a, a true service to our community. Um, so let's do as Masi. Thank you very much, everybody. All right. All right, thank you. So we're gonna move on to the next item of the agenda. And this item is the joint informational hearing 
uh, entitled The Status of Environmental and Cultural Impacts to Magua and Latexan. Um, so I have a, a sub-agenda, which is to, to start out with the in just introductions, basic background, uh, followed by the historic cultural significance of these sites, and then the Section 106 process, endangered species mitigations, and, um, you know, and then we're going to invite the community to, um, to present testimony. Okay. So the purpose of today's informational hearing is to inform the people of Guam about Project J-17 and the cultural historic significance of the ancestral places implicated by this project in addition to the live fire training range complex. Um, this committee is, is seeking meaningful public participation in the Section 106 process, as well as an update on the status of historic properties and the inadvertent discoveries at the sites of uh, Magua and the live fire training range complex, complex at La Texan. According to the recent Navy memo for J-17, uh, the project involves design studies and construction of telecommunications infrastructure at the site planned for the Marine Corps camp in Finnegods and Dedido. The project itself spans 57 acres and involves the grading, digging, trenching, drilling, boring, and or cut and fill to construct two single story ADNs or area distribution nodes along with site improvements consisting of pavements around the uh, ADNs for vehicle circulation and parking, drainage and utility systems, as well as an installation of communication lines. This project, J-17, takes place on three ancestral sites, treated as eligible for the listing in the National Register of Historic Places, with archeological evidence suggesting a historic and cultural connection to the Ladi period. These sites were numbered 66-08-2303, we now know as Magua, 66-08-2305, and 6608-2307. Present at two of these sites were human remains, as well as numerous artifacts from a number of periods in our people's history, including but not limited to hot new, laddy stones, pottery sherds, lusong, ads, Sanahi, an earth oven, remnants of family ranches, as well as evidence of the first American territorial period and Japanese occupation. Despite concerns by the public that artifacts and ancestral remains be preserved in place and undisturbed, these contents have been removed from the sites, according to the Navy's mitigation guidelines. It is important to note that these lands have been cleared prior to today's hearing and that we are nearing the closure of public comment period, which ends in June, July 15th on Wednesday. Today, we will hear from speakers, native landowners, as well as people with a working knowledge of Section 106 process, the State Historic Preservation Office Officer, um, Patrick Lujan, as well as um, other members of the community, which will be reserved at the end of this session. Okay, so now I would like to invite um, a background about the importance, the ancestral importance of these sites. Um, I would like to invite, um, so if everyone can put on their, uh, Mike Carson, so I'd like to invite Mike Carson to talk about, actually, uh, yeah, Mike Carson, if you can start talking about the, uh, the, the areas that you were surveying and the, the importance of, of your work. Okay, thank you, Senator. Thank you everyone for <clears throat> tuning in. Uh, I should start saying uh, for Magua, I'm not the best expert on that particular site, but I can talk more about the Texan and, and the Retidian area. <clears throat> but uh, because Magua is, is uh, a major concern right now, I can tell you what I do know about it, which is it is a traditional uh, village uh, area. Um, and there's a number of interpretations about how intensive of a use it was and other questions about disturbance. But the bigger picture is that it is a important site where we have learned information uh, about the past that we didn't know before. 
and it also relates with a number of living traditions among families today who uh, have their own memories and, and traditions that they have remembered about the place. So it is significant in a number of ways. And that is one of the places like in Northwest Field where you see direct impact of construction, you know, with like a footprint of physical, you know, transformation of the landscape. So those places would would have a number of, of different concerns about like direct physical transformation of the land and how that forever changes the ability to continue those traditions about those places. Um, <clears throat> now you can add on top of that another layer of concern in uh, with the live fire training areas where you have those, you, you all know that, that the surface danger zones that extend over much larger areas and the effects that those bring about uh, access and 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 changing the the landscape and context in 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 direct and indirect ways. Now the uh, the Texan area is a place where I have worked the most uh, in conjunction with the the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service. And what is important there as an archaeologist is the the fact that we have found so much diversity of archaeology and history in that area. You can look at every time period uh, of Guam and, and in fact of the Mariana Islands in terms of natural history and cultural history and how they interrelate and everything is there in that one place. Not only that, but <clears throat> the full range and diversity uh, of findings in terms of uh, habitation sites, caves and rock art, uh, water resources that change through time, uh, the, uh, the kinds of foods that people ate, etc. I could go on and on, but uh, everything that you could want to study about the past is there. And the fact that we have a, such a, a strong community involvement in the area is another factor that is, is just one of those intangible factors where uh, ha having so much public participation and people visiting the site and making it into their own experience, um, you can't <laughs> really put any value figure on that. And with, with the the potential for, for closures and change of access, um, that's another concern uh, that I would leave open for discussions. Now, I could go on and on, but I, I'd rather uh, let other people talk, and if I can answer specific questions, and I'll, I'll do that for you. Okay, so um, I was gonna also switch over to um, Magua's site. Uh, we'll, we'll reserve questions for later if that's okay. But I do want to kind of uh, basically show the context, uh, how context is important. And it's not just, uh, I know with your work, you did, you did a lot of that. Um, you kind of show the, the cultural landscape is not just you know, artifacts themselves, but it's the, the natural environment. And it has a really, it's integrated into um, the, art, you know, the artifacts that we find. It's, it's all part of the cultural context. So um, I also wanted to give uh, some voice, um, maybe we can do some, before we switch over to the Magua site, um, I, I, I wanted to provide some context regards to the native land owners of the Texan and um, kind of expanding upon that, that idea that, you know, the, the site is more than just the artifacts, the cultural landscape is, it goes beyond just the artifacts. Uh, it's the people, right? It's the connection of the, uh, the land uh, by our people, um, that that is what brings a lot of the meaning to the importance of these sites. Uh, regardless of whether we're living there consistently, um, there still is that that connection. So um, I do want to provide this opportunity for a representative, the landowner um, Maria Hernandez. Buenas and half a day, Jesus Maasi, for having me here today. Um, 
I appreciate all of your time to discuss uh, this contentious issue much further. So I am actually a fifth generation descendant of the uh, Latexan landowners, my Tata and my great grandma, my Nana Biha. Um, they built homes on the property. They grew up on the property. Um, my great grandparents, the late Benigno, Leongaro Flores, and the late Dolores Martinez Flores, as well as my great grandmother, the late Ana Matanani Pangalina, are the rightful owners of many hectares of Retidium Point. Uh, the land our family owns extends from the area where the wildlife refuge, refuge offices are to the beach side and back into the caves. My Tata paved the road down to La Texan using a bulldozer he rented. And uh, my family knew how to navigate the jungles and cliffs. We have family buried in the soil there. The Live Fire Training Range Complex ignores generations of deep history of landowner families who lived at Retidian and were stewards of the land prior to its condemnation. After World War II, the US military condemned the land via eminent domain, and we continue to fight for its rightful return after it was taken under duress and without just compensation. So because of the great urgency surrounding my family's land, it was taken into the 60s, became excess in the early 90s, and uh, for the second time was taken from my family. Uh, it was another big blow that my family experienced. And as a little girl, I was actually present um, in my you know, four or five years old at the protests. And I feel like that passion really has followed me to present day. Um, you know, feeling the, the, just the intense energy at the time, marching down the road at La Texan, that has stayed with me. And um, it just, when, when, when our generation thinks of La Texan, we really do think of home. That is, um, you know, we, we have a very, very strong connection to that land. And I think anybody that visits there would, would know that there, it's a very high energy sort of place. There's a lot of history there. So um, in 2017, we are, our family actually um, joined the SCIS hearings in 2014. We had so many family go up to the microphone and testify at the three public hearings. What, that was in 2014 when the uh, site was first proposed to be used for the range. And actually, sadly, many of our um, fighters in our family have actually passed away um, in recent years. And so it really is, um, you know, in, in remembrance of them and in honoring them that our generation is continuing the fight. So we in 2017 decided to um, take part in the organization Protehila Texan Save Retidian. Um, PLSR is a direct action group dedicated to the protection of natural and resources identified for the DOD life fire training on Guam. Uh, the group opposes the establishment of any military firing range. We stand in solidarity with Guardians of Gunny, pa uh, Pagan Watch, Tinian Women's Association, and Alternative Zero Coalition by preventing environmental destruction and um, degradation on sacred and native, sacred and native lands. And our group continues the pursuit for the return of ancestral lands. So in January 11, 2017, Pratea Texan was formed out of great necessity, alarm and, and deep concern from um, local people across many, many facets of the community. Um, and this was in response to the plans to establish a US Marine firing range. So we, would ha we had actually at the first meeting, a number of people that had joined not just um, the, the Latexan landowners, but Salamti, fishermen, business people, college students, farmers, teachers, social workers, cultural practitioner, practitioners, environmentalists, so many others joined the first meeting at the Tsmooning Community Center and exchanged thoughts um, and strategy on how we want to uh, halt the project proposal. So in February 2017, we launched an online petition on change.org 
The petition has garnered over 17,500 signatures to date. Uh, after lobbying our lawmakers to pass legislation to halt construction on the range complex, two resolutions were passed in the 34th and 35th Guam legislatures. The former calling for a pause and the latter calling initially for a complete halt to the construction. In the end, the language in the second um, resolution was changed to from a halt to a pause after concerns were raised by pro build up lawmakers. So as I mentioned, many of our members had attended the, um, the SEIS hearings in 2014. From that time, those hearings um, were held to mi around mid-2017. All the information relative to the firing range um, kind of went under the radar. And we were not provided as a community with any developments for the project. And out of nowhere, like a punch in the gut, we had learned that the construction contract for the live fire training range complex had been awarded to Black Construction in August 2017. And uh, something that PLSR has consistently requested for all sacred land is that it remain untouched to respect the authenticity and dignity of cultural and historic sites so our people can connect to these invaluable parts of our identity. We continue to stress that of the five options assessed for the Marine Life Fire Training Range Complex, Tai Lalo, or Northwest Field, was determined to be the worst choice for our community. Studies that form the development of the Military supp Supplemental Impact Statement that assessed the feasibility of Tai Lalo concluded that Tai Lalo was not considered a reasonable alternative. And both the study itself and the Guam Historic Preservation Office determined a range at Tai Lalo would result in, quote, more adverse harmful effects from operations under alternative five than under any other alternatives, end quote. So something that my Tata had always told, um, you know, generations of my family is that God gave us so much, take only what you need. And it is my family's, um, to my family, we believe that the military has taken too much. And this project and the build-up projects impacting our cultural heritage sites with possible impacts to our island's only, our main water source is an affront to the indigenous rights of the Chamorro people. And in fact, is a violation of the United Nations um, rights of indigenous peoples, declaration of the rights of indigenous peoples. And I just wanted to, read a few. Um, uh, there is a, an excerpt from a Guampedia article written um, on post-war pillaging that um, the historical record supports, um, you know, this narrative that I am sharing that, quote, as the Chamorros saw their land being taken without immediate compensation, they became suspicious of the U.S. government's motives for recapturing Guam. Their suspicions grew into anger as they Watch the military take control of the acres, amounting to 63% of all of the land on Guam. It became immediately apparent that the U.S. could not possibly use all the land it was taking and that it intended to control the lives of the Chamorros by depriving them of their sole source of sustenance. In 1991, the Fish and Wildlife um, Refuge was established against the will of the people. Bill 845 enacted Public Law 22-111 challenged the Retidian lands being used as a critical habitat or wildlife refuge. In the legislative intent, the 22nd body had stated, quote, that as a matter of record, the people of Guam did not wish in any way, wish any land in Guam to be designated without their consent as a critical habitat or wildlife refuge, and that the action of the executive branch of the government of Guam at the time in approving such a designation was contrary to the best interests of the people of Guam and to their will. The 30th Guam legislature passed resolution 258-30, which opposed the condemnation of Retidian land by the federal government for purposes of training ranges and reminded Congress that, quote, the final insult to the people of Guam came when the 385 acres of the formal, former naval facility Guam at Retidian Point 
was declared excess in the 90s and was grabbed quietly without fanfare or advance notice by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, rather than being returned to the original landowners via the government of Guam, end quote. These pieces of legislation provide a very important historical backdrop for the debate surrounding the Retidian land. Also importantly, the introduction of HR 4402, which authorized the Secretary of the Navy to establish a surface danger zone over the refuge was introduced by Congresswoman Bordalio on April 4th, 2014, without first being vetted through the people of Guam, the Guam legislature, or even through consultation with us, the original landowners, whose lives are forever impacted by it. And in, in meetings with the Congresswoman in 2015, she had shared that a firing range might actually be beneficial to our family because once the military is done using it, perhaps at this point, it would be a return to us. While this hypothetical scenario is too simplistic and it ignores the irreversible environmental and cultural degradation and desecration, and there is no in clear indication as to when this firing range would no longer be in use. Even in that hypothetical scenario, the range will have already caused long-term effects in the form of toxic contaminations entering the environment. So I come here today to urge you, our lawmakers, to do everything that you can to correct the injustice and pain done to my elders and my family that we experience to this day by doing everything and anything in your power to put a stop to this proposed firing range at Northwest Field, which, as I said, even according to military documents, is the option that will bring the most adverse effects to our environment and cultural resources, both in the construction of the range as well as during its operation. And I want to again stress that my great grandparents did not want their land to be taken away in the 60s and vehemently fought this injustice. My family did not want the land to be turned into a wildlife refuge in the 90s. And we are very much in favor of the conservation of wildlife and endangered species. But the reality is that the land was taken under forest deceit and theft. And for more than five decades, my family has been fighting this injustice. This option to use Rotidian for the firing range ignores common decency and respect toward the original landowners as well as to, toward the indigenous people of Guam. So you do us Masi for uh, this opportunity to speak. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Maria. And that was very powerful. And, you know, just to show that, you know, our, our co connection to the land also comes with the, the responsibility of protecting it regardless of the challenges that face us. So thank you for all the struggles that your family has faced. Um, I would like to now turn the floor over. So we'll, we'll have more conti continued comments, uh, con community concerns towards the end, but I would like to, uh, uh, to give the floor to um, Mr. Dave Lotz regarding the cultural significance of Magua site. Thank you, senators. Good afternoon and other uh, participants. I am going to summarize a paper that I recently uh, produced, the Saga of Magua Village. This is dated June 25th, 2020. If you've not received it, you can re uh, obtain it from myself and also uh, the two chairpersons of this committee uh, heading the hearing have it also available. Uh, I had provided some slides. Are those available? Yes, they are. Um, so Evan should be queuing it. Just give us a moment. Okay, yeah, that, that will be fine because what I wanted to start with, and I can go ahead and commence while the slides are going up is, uh, first of all, Magua was an interior uplifted limestone plateau village. It was probably the most relatively intact until it was destroyed by the military uh, in the latter part of 2018. Prior villages also existed on these upland plateaus and there are a little bit of remnants left on Rota, but clearly uh, Magua had the most extensive remains until two years ago. An initial representation or identification in Western literature comes from a 1676 map of Father Alfonso. 
And just about in the middle, you can see where there's a notation of the village of Magua. If we could go further to the next slide. And we're jumping ahead to the 1900s. Magua was part of a vast land holding by the Artero family. And our, the Arteros maintained this until the land was seized by the military towards the end of World War II. It was the property of Pasquale Artero and Antonio Artero had a ranch on the site. You can see uh, somewhat in the middle, Magua is identified very clearly on the map. Perhaps the most noted aspect of Magua being used uh, historically is nearby along the cliffs was where uh, Antonio hid George Tweed. But the Arteros used the land for crops and cattle and also harvesting of lumber. Again, this uh, saw relatively, as far as we know, no damage to the cultural resources there until the land was uh, began to be taken by the military and used for other purposes. All of this was clearly before the United States government had to comply with the Historic Preservation Act, most notably the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966. Let's go on to slide three, please. This is a 1949 aerial photo. And in the red is the core feature of Magua that uh, previously had identified Laddie and Luzon. But I do want to indicate clearly that while there's a number of numerous artifact locations of various types in this broader landscape, I think we need to not look at those as isolated features, but as a component of a much larger Chamorro cultural landscape. I think we need to look at the idea of cultural landscapes is what we're identifying and discussing and what should have been preserved. Now in comparison, we'll go to slide four. Slide four, now this still exists. The Navy constructed a housing area in the 70s and actually preserved the laddie in this area. There's a 1972 archeological report done by the University of Guam that also mentions a lot of other features in this area that were bulldozed and destroyed. To me, this indicates there was another extensive habitation area in this area. These housing has been recently abandoned. The coconut trees have all been devastated by a coconut rhino beetle, but um, also there's really no maintenance on the park and this is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. I'm going to continue very briefly to show you the progression of what's happened back up at Magua, which is now called Naval Computer and Telecommunications Station. Let's go to the next slide, please. This shows aerial photos with some uh, notations made of what the base looked like in the 1950s and in the 1960s as it was becoming more and more essential to naval communications in the area. The core part of Magua Village is on the, on the top uh, photo is just above what's called the DF antenna. And that's where again, the Laddie and the, uh, the Lusong were found. I also think it's important to note that there was a natural depression there uh, until it was destroyed. It was surrounded bam by bamboo, which clearly indicated that was a, a, a water source. And then if you look at the same area, at the lower photo, you can see additional facilities were constructed in the area. Again, this is all pre-Marine Corps development, but it shows a considerable amount of the area still relatively in, intact. Shall we move on please to the next slide? Just wanna discuss a little bit about 
there is an inherent requirement by the military, the Navy, the Marines, to perform environmental compliance, Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act and the National Environmental Protection Act. These are procedural. They only have to go through the process. It does not halt any particular uh, uh, construction. And it is, is supposed to clearly identify resources in the area. One of my concerns is in the environmental impact statement and even the archeological surveys, there was no mention of Magua Village. It all had a name, a number of 66-08-2303, which to me, it's, it's using the scientific terminology, but it also dehumanizes the people and the remnants that were in the location. Uh, and this holds similar to the National Historic Preservation Act because in this process, it talks about the construction there will have adverse impacts on historic properties without saying what those impacts were. As a matter of fact, the programmatic agreement that was a result of the 106 process uses that exact terminology. It doesn't talk about destroying a Chamorro cultural site. It just uses the rather dry phase adverse effects on historic properties. Let's, let's move on, please, because the next section is, next slide, please, is uh, we've all been invited in some form or another to express our views. And yet more and more as this process went on, we really discovered we did not have a really working dialogue with the Navy in this process to come up with any particular solution. Uh, most recently, you made reference to a, a memorandum uh, open for public comment based upon a project in this area. Uh, you're invited to give public comments, but you give those comments. They do not have to do anything with those. So it is not really truly a public input uh, process. I do also want to state that the Navy has used, uh, has always come up with the statement that they are bound by federal law to not disclose the locations and what is at these areas dealing with cultural resources, citing sections of the National Historic Preservation Act and citing the Archaeological Resources Protection Act. I am of the opinion that these citations are not mandatory, but they are discretionary. And unfortunately, we find the military chooses to state that they are mandatory. The, the applicability becomes then the true owners of these cultural sites, the Chamorro people of Guam, are deprived of knowledge of what is their resources. And in many cases, these battles over cultural resources become a battle of really truly who do they belong to. I submit they belong to the Chamorro people and not to the military. Let's continue on. If you look, this is the basic clearing project for the Marine Corps base. The orange is the footprint of the clearing for the project. The orange is everything that is to be or has been cleared. This project actually comes before the one that the most recent memo was uh, put out for, which I'm a little bit uh, confused. I do appreciate everybody's attention to this, but if you were to look at these memos that just came out, it talks about cultural resources uh, was, it uses the past tense because in fact, they've been already destroyed in this prior clearing. And if you look in the middle, you can see that circle. That's where the core of Magua village was where the Luthong were found, the Laddie and uh, the bamboo grove. Moving on, that was a diagram the next, uh, next slide, please. 
This gives you an aerial view that was taken, taken a little bit more than a year ago of the extent of the clearing at the future Marine Corps base. As you can tell, it's quite extensive. That's much more extensive than the clearing for the firing range. These are in two different locations. This is the Finnegagen site. Uh, the Latejan firing range is off towards the horizon within that northern plateau, but quite a lot of clearing was done in that location. Uh, moving on to the next slide. Just want to give you a view of what was seen in this area in October of 17. Next slide. Now, I'm giving a lot of attention to the bamboo grove in this area. It's a, it was a natural feature. I was in there. It's a sump. It's a natural place for the water to collect. As we know, bamboo tends to grow where there's a lot of water. In one of the uh, comments that the Navy made when this clearing became public knowledge was, well, it was only occasionally occupied, but I submit that that is not necessarily correct. We're talking about habitation that was 500 years ago. At that time, and Dr. Rosalind Hunter Anderson had produced a paper dealing more with Paluntok that shows that there was more rainfall on the island at that time, which would clearly indicate habitation was much more extensive at this area. Now, moving on. Now, this is uh, pictures in October of 18, and this was only the beginning of the clearing. This is just vegetation removing even before any sort of grading or grading or digging was accomplished. Next slide. And here's another extensive look at the area. As you can tell, it is, it is quite a drastic. And let's continue on to the next slide. Now here we're seeing uh, two of the laddie when they were still at the location. The Navy did uh, save these to possibly be put in a display at some time. And I say possibly because there's been no firm commitments for any sort of display of this. But even if there was, putting items on display or putting artifacts uh, to me in boxes or bags is not historic preservation. Historic preservation is you need to preserve that whole cultural resource. Next slide. Next slide there. And here's a, here's a loose song in this area. So that gives you a quick glimpse of that area. And I want to move on just a little bit and mention a couple other things relative to this. Uh, let's move on to the next slide. A lot of this evolves about all the conditions in the programmatic agreement. And Guam was supposed to receive a lot of benefits. I submit that a lot of these really are not a benefits to us. The one that was most uh, one of those that became out that was highlighted was there was supposed to be a public access program. Very few people have taken advantage of this program. It has too many bureaucratic requirements. First of all, you have to go down to Naval Base Guam, uh, pass an ID to get your pass. And then they always say, uh, it's always subject to cancellation because of mission requirements. It seems to me this should equal mission requirements requirements. You're also limited to the number of people and it has to be escorted. And by the way, this whole public access program is not functioning at this time to, to the COVID crisis. And in addition, while this was required by the programmatic agreement in 2011, it was not actually implemented until 2016. 
The other aspect I alluded to was the funding for the Guam Cultural Repository that is and proposed to be uh, constructed at the University of Guam. And uh, to me, that is not preservation, that is simply storing artifacts. And along with artifacts, you find reports, but these reports really are not put out there for public uh, this, uh, consumption. And people will actually appreciate, honor, respect, and visit these village sites. I really do not see a lot of people going to visit boxes and bags of artifacts. The other aspect of this is they're being currently taken care of by the military. Once a repository is built, it's turned over to the University of Guam and the curation and management becomes the obligation funding and staffing wise to the government of Guam. Even though all the destruction was done by the military, it becomes the, suddenly the obligation of Guam to curate this, which could have been left on the ground in sight. One of the questions has never been answered was, why was not the footprint of Magua avoided? We have not received an answer from the Navy. It seems to me they could have adjusted the footprint and preserved an awful lot of, uh, of our cultural resources up at Magua. By the way, this photo is at a site in the Naval Magazine. Uh, there are a few other things here. I've mentioned the fact of the limitations, the rainfall, and the fact we need to preserve historic sites. But while I'm, I'm mentioning concerns about the Navy, I, how I feel they do not respect our cultural resources, again, I feel the Guam Historic Preservation Office needs to be more assertive. They did not have to sign off to, on a programmatic agreement. There is inherently no requirement to sign off on programmatic agreements. There is a requirement for Guam Historic Preservation Officer to participate in the Section 106 process, and it did not have to fall into programmatic agreement. It's also uh, rather certain that there's been political influence in when that was uh, put together and signed off and with the, the stipulations of it. But I'm also very much concerned that Guam law uh, talks basically historic preservation office is mandated to preserve historic sites, to do research and to do education. But to me too often, our, our, uh, what comes out of Guam Historic Preservation Office relative to archeology span is what I would, would call sanctioned destruction in the archeological field It's called salvage archeology. span I do not see in Guam law a basis for that. And I think we need to be assertive in these processes and to make sure that the, there's more public input into our preservation efforts and that we just basically preserve our cultural resources. Uh, I could go on with some more, but if, you get a, if you're further interested, please get a hold of me or the two senators who are co hosting this uh, hearing and please uh, avail yourselves of my report. So thank you for the time and attendance on this, and I, I trust it's been helpful. Uh, thank you so much, Dave. Thank you so much, Dave, uh, for the, um, the briefing on the Magua site. Um, so now uh, we're going to turn to State Historic Preservation Officer uh, Patrick Shippo. Um, I'm sorry, Patrick Lujan, who's the State Historic Preservation Officer. Uh, so if you can unmute yourself. So first of all, thank you. Uh, Mr. Luhan for, for joining this meeting today. Um, so part of the agenda is to find out what, what has happened with the inverted discoveries, the burials, um, what is so far the, the impact uh, to Magua and the, the Tailalo, La Texan area. Sorry, can't hear. Is your mic turned on? Yeah. 
Sorry, if you're speaking, we can't hear you. Maybe check your um, audio. Can't hear still. Hi, Patrick. Uh, can are you speaking? We can't hear you. Uh, you're unmuted, but uh, if you're speaking, we still can't hear you. Uh, Okay, so uh, we're going, he's gonna work out the technical difficulties. Hopefully uh, he could figure um, it out, but are you? Okay, so um, Patrick, if you're speaking, can you just say something? We're not sure if we can. Uh, Okay, so we can have our um, audio uh, check with you to see, uh, try to troubleshoot it. Okay, so um, MIS is saying maybe you should restart your computer and try back again and rejoin the call. Maybe that might work. Okay, so uh, while we're waiting for um, Mr. Lahan to restart, uh, we'll, we'll go on to the next speaker. So um, one of the, the, the things that, um, well, maybe we'll wait. So uh, we asked some experts about mapping, uh, non-invasive mapping to provide some sort of information uh, because I know one of the issues was data recovery, the process of data recovery. Um, that it, it actually is what Mr. Lotz had mentioned is salvage archaeology, where the actual site is, is disturbed and destroyed. So um, there has been, you know, recommendations from archaeologists and community members. You know, there's other ways of figuring something out if something exists before any kind of disturbing happens on the ground. So we've asked um, and Dr. Ramina King and... Um, I believe it's Dr. Aban, that's correct, uh, to provide some of their expertise in regards to non-invasive mapping. Um, so this came to my attention uh, because I believe there was a, even satellite, satellite imagery that could do subsurface um, archeology span uh, with very clear resolution. Um, and they, they were able to apply this in, I believe in Europe or Italy where they were able to see, you could see the underground archeology span of things. So um, if I can have uh, Dr. Romina King, if she can provide some information regarding this type of technology or what, what other uh, alternatives are out there uh, to do this type of uh, surveys that doesn't disturb the site. Um, half a day, Senator. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you loud and clear. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, so I'm honored to be considered an expert and um, I look forward to sharing any kind of knowledge I might have to help you with your issues. So given the topic is what kind of mapping technologies are there uh, for non-invasive subsurface investigations? Um, I'm going to share two main technologies and there are more, but I feel the two main ones that might be most appropriate for this issue and this discussion at hand would be uh, LIDAR imagery. So our, not imagery rather, it's, it's LIDAR. It stands for uh, light detection and ranging. Um, and it's a remote sensing method that uses basically light in the form of like a laser. Um, and so you shoot a laser down to the earth. And then when the laser comes back, 
you can get the distance from where the laser was shot to where it hit the point on the planet. Um, and since you know the speed of light, it's, it's pretty easy to, not easy, but computer intensive to calculate the, uh, the three-dimensional uh, elevation of, of the planet. So for Guam, we have two, uh, two LIDAR data sets, one in 2007 and one in 2013. And just recently, my colleague, Dr. Aban and I, we, uh, we are a part of a CSU project uh, for vegetation in the Finnegatsen Basin. And uh, Dr. Aban used the 2013 LIDAR to generate a bare earth model uh, with 10 centimeter resolution from the LIDAR data set. The LIDAR is publicly available. You can download the original point clouds from the NOAA website. Um, and that is what we had used. And so he uh, used that. We, we were going to use it to, to uh, calculate a canopy heights model, but uh, we were also interested in the bare earth. And so he did a bare earth terrain and he found some interesting features that are outside of our project area. And I'm gonna let him share those results with you. Um, so LIDAR is one technology that we could utilize more um, prior to any kind of development is to, to kind of do a, a broad area, see what's there, see what old roads were there, maybe see some old um, historic artifacts, etc. cetera. Um, you can also use, in addition to LIDAR, the other uh, technology is ground penetrating radar. So that uses radar pulses to image the subsurface. And um, you, it looks kind of like a lawnmower that you kind of tow around. And given the area, if it's a karst terrain, you should be able to get some really good images from it. Um, you know, in, in, again, my background is in natural resources not say cultural resources, but you could use the ground penetrating radar to map unknown uh, karst caves, which is what I'm more familiar with that application. But I know that it has been used in archeological investigations as well. Um, so you can also use um, unmanned aerial vehicles uh, to take some imagery of the area, high resolution imagery. The only problem is, is that if it's DOD property, you aren't allowed to use unmanned aerial vehicles, um, especially if they come from China. There's been just a ban on that. You need permission from the Pentagon in order to get that. And it's very, very difficult. Um, but these are just some of the three. Uh, there's also a uh, Sentinel-1. That's also, uh, that's satellite imagery. And they have used that as well for satellite investigations. I think the most famous application of that was the Nazca lines, when um, those uh, lines in Peru, someone had uh, vandalized them. And they used that imagery, they used that imagery from that satellite to see uh, what got disturbed and when it was disturbed. So um, again, those that's just literally like the tip of, the iceberg. I'm sure I could, or uh, uh, Dr. Karsten could probably conduct a class just on GIS remote sensing and archaeological applications. Um, okay, I think that's all I got. Do you have any questions Thank for me? <laughs> um, but Dr. Aben would be able to share the LIDAR findings. Thank you so much, Dr. King, uh, for that uh, overview. Uh, Dr. Aban, um, I appreciate if you can uh, share some of your findings that were not part of the scope of your, your work, but that could possibly lead to, um, you know, more investigation and, and, and also, you know, how can we apply this type of technology to kind of solve this, um, you know, prevent disruption of the, the ground surface, archaeolo archaeologically speaking. And welcome, first of all, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, senators and uh, distinguished guests. Uh, and buenas. It's my first time to uh, join a Zoom, Zoom meeting uh, with distinguished uh, government uh, 
and and um, uh, public officials and entities. Um, I'm I'm quite honored to uh, provide my expertise uh, in, in remote sensing together with uh, my colleague uh, Dr. Romina King. So uh, we were tasked to do some uh, um, research project on how we, we may be able to exploit and explore LIDAR as a means to go and, and image uh, an area of Pinay Gajan. Sorry for my, <laughs> I'm still getting used to uh, speaking uh, the, the Chamorro language. Anyway, uh, we did some preliminary work on that area and quite astonishingly, we were, we were able to extract very um, peculiar uh, features from the LiDAR data. So uh, as uh, been uh, given uh, some background by my colleague, Dr. King, LiDAR is one of the few of a plethora of uh, remote sensing tools that we can uh, make use of. One good thing about LiDAR is that it can penetrate through canopy so that you can actually be able to image subsurface or rather below canopy, below, below the trees, which is, basically, which is basically the ground data that we're interested in. So from the research that we've been doing, um, uh, we were able to see some uh, curious looking structures and here's some of them. So um, uh, what you're seeing right now is actually, let me just remove some of the layers before we go into the products. Okay. So uh, we, were, we were actually looking, uh, um, are you seeing my screen right now? Um, no, what we can do is perhaps if you can uh, email it to, um, do you mind emailing that over? Or is it, does it require a specific application? It's actually uh, on the platform of Google Earth. So if, if I can be, uh, if my screen can be enabled right now. Um, uh, I'm not yeah. sure if we have that capacity. Uh, is that possible? Great. There it is. Here we go. Thank you. That's somebody's. So, okay, is, is my, okay, it's, it's showing now. Yeah. So here's, here's the area that we were uh, interested in on making some research. And, and basically this is the Finnegan, North Finnegan area. And as you can see on Google Earth, uh, this is the top of the canopy of, of mostly Vitex, uh, species of Vitex, Parviflora, and some invasives. So uh, this is the usual image that's taken by an optical or a multispectral um, satellite. So one, as I said, one thing interesting about LiDAR is that it can penetrate through canopy with, with laser technology. And, and from this, we can actually get uh, this kinds of image. What you're seeing right now should be a, 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 a menagerie of, of yellow and orange colored um, images. And this is basically the image of the tree canopy. So we're looking at the surface or the top of the canopies. Okay? So the higher the canopy is, the higher the tree is, the more redder it is. Okay? So what the, what, the, what the LiDAR sensor picks up is the canopy layer as well as the ground layers. So let me flash the ground layer Okay, so what you're seeing on your screens right now is actually the ground surface. So it can actually go through the canopy and image the ground. So what you're looking now is basically the ground. Okay. And you can see very uh, curious looking structures. Okay. If I flash in and out the, 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 um, Sorry. 
if I flush in and out the, the ground image, okay, you have the trees, but you can actually image below the trees and this is the ground. And you can see some very interesting structures showing up. Uh, this particular structure cannot be seen with with a regular satellite image, but it, sh it shows up as some peculiar structures. And these are very interesting structures. For one, they're actually hidden under the canopy. And you can even see some roads showing up on this, on this image. This is a road which is actually invisible from the top of the canopy. And zooming out, you can even see some structures showing up in this particular area of, of the uh, Finnegan, North Finnegan. Again, uh, we, we haven't verified those structures yet, but they are actually showing up on, on the LiDAR image. So as regards to the use of LiDAR as a non-invasive um, non um, form of technology, definitely LiDAR is a very uh, possible tool to use for non-invasive uh, prospecting of archeological sites. Uh, you, you can see some fine structures showing up here. By the way, this is a 10 centimeter resolution image. That means each of those pixels that you see has a resolution of around 10 centimeters. And that's a very high, uh, high resolution image. You can see some roads showing up here which are uh, hidden if, if you were to actually uh, just use a regular multispectral image. So um, again, uh, there are very interesting objects and structures that can be imaged by LiDAR. And it's one of the best, if not the best, uh, non-invasive um, technology that we can use for archaeological prospecting. So I believe there was a quarry site that was there. So it'd be interesting to find, yes. find what the correlation is from what, what are the features that you're finding? Um, yes, ma'am. Yes, Senator. Uh, this one here is actually uh, was uh, was a quarry site. This, uh, this structure here used to be a quarry site. And, and as you can see here, there are roads showing up on the LiDAR image that leads to that quarry. And then this structures, which is actually now hidden under a thick veil of canopy. If I, if I flash the, um, the, um, the raw canopy image, those structures are actually hidden, cannot be seen from, from above. If, 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 you, if we do use LiDAR, we can actually penetrate into, into the canopy and see the subsurface, much like an X-ray would do, an X-ray imaging would do. It can go through, through canopy. Yeah, that I guess uh, as far as like burials, but I th at the quarry site that I was referring to was the uh, for the um, the laddie stones. <clears throat> I believe there was a quarry site <clears throat> that was used to produce the laddie sets that were there. Whoa. So yeah, that's definitely useful information. I think that you know how well we can resolve uh, provide resolution for like burials and any other artifacts. Um, that would be, this is definitely an important tool. So um, thank you, Dr. Bond, for that, um, that uh, presentation. That was very uh, insightful in more ways than one. Thank you so much. Thank you.
So yeah, you can, um, I guess, stay later for questions uh, from my colleagues. Um, we're gonna continue on with the agenda. Uh, we have um, Patrick Lujan, are you audible? Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, very, very clear, thank you. Thank you so much. Awesome. great. Okay, great. Thank you for uh, having us. I have state archaeologist John Mark Joseph with me. You want to scoot over just a little to say hello? Hmm. Hello. All right. Thank you. Right. Thank, you. Oh, Thank you to the both of you. Okay. For yes. Um, so we're actually here to answer any of your questions. Um, kind of just going over the last probably a good year since since I've been back in the in the seat here in the Shippo's office. Um, just uh, to, to give a, an update for everybody. Um, working closely with Department of the Navy and, and Marine Corps Guam on all their findings, pretty much they're on all on, uh, data recovery uh, stages right now in recovering um, all types of archeological findings and, and human remains. Um, you know, it, it, it really keeps us busy here, keeps John Mark busy as far as uh, reviewing all the, the reports and, and the requirements uh, based off of the programmatic agreement and the resolution letter of 2018, um, pretty much they've been following uh, according to what was uh, required of them. And then, and then moving forward as far as the live uh, firing range, I, I know the, um, you know, there's been word of, of issuing of a uh, stipulation 13 of the programmatic agreement. Um, we have uh, Ms. Jessica Toff from the Attorney General's office that's uh, um, helping us out from a, from a legal standpoint. Um, and we're looking at a stipulation 14 of the programmatic agreement, which, which is just a general overall amendment to the programmatic agreement as opposed to uh, stip 13, which calls for uh, 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 resolution of of um, disagreement resolution. So I, I believe based off of what has been done already in the projects leading to the last uh, firing range, uh, Department of Navy is in agreement with us that the programmatic agreement does need to be amended. And so we're working right now with our legal to, uh, to issue and invoke a step 14 of the PA. So other than that, as far as technicalities, John Mark is here to answer any of your questions. Uh, I myself as well. Um, and uh, we're, so far we have been really enjoying the presentations that have been given this afternoon. Okay, well, that's news to me about stipulation 14. Can you just go, uh, describe what that's about? Or, you know, what was the, uh, you know, I, I wanna go into the, the impacts, but I just, to mention that I wanted to kind of know what is uh, the sure sure so uh, 13 step 13 is resolving objections um, where step 14 is amending the PA itself so they in, in dialogue with um, the Navy they're in agreement that uh, to amend it as far as the requirements and and what so far uh, what has what needs to be done moving forward based off of lessons learned in the, in the first four firing ranges. So that is on the programmatic agreement on page, I believe it's 36 of 62. Okay. Uh, yes, yeah, so I guess we can go into that later, but maybe I, you know, the PA is a whole document that I feel there's, it's, there's potential to kind of achieve what community is what you know, protecting things, you know, I feel that there's there's still potential there, but perhaps if we can go back and talk about the inadvertent discoveries uh, that were found in 2018, um, and I believe also in, yeah, 2018, if you can follow up, uh, I believe there's a annual report or semi-annual reports that are provided by the military, and if you can uh, just follow through what, what happened. Uh, with the inadvertent discoveries. In, you want to go ahead and? Um, well, it, it, excuse me, um, Senator, we couldn't hear you, kind of cutting in and out. Um, basically, we've had uh, numerous inadvertent discoveries on uh, J001B, 
and at uh, 715. Um, so right now we uh, work towards those, uh, documenting those. And I think that's changed the paradigm of uh, how people lived on the plateau, wh whether it was temporary, uh, but now they found decent midden sites and all that to say that, that it was more permanent than previously thought. So it, it, it's really a, a monumental thing to say that we've been able to kind of change that paradigm and have a more permanent settlements there. Um, also, in doing this, we've come into a place where we're going to put in the Amendment 14 to the PA to see if we can't preserve, have that preserved in place. And so um, right now we're working towards getting that done and preserving it in place changing the 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 way the military is looking at it we tried to put in objections to change magua to where they could have moved the intersection and perhaps the ponding basin to you know move that down to a different location and i have tried that back in 2017 we were unsuccessful then um but um right you know i have to speak to what where we're at now and so um, right now we're trying to get one of the places preserved in place, get them to change their design. So we're gonna bring them back to the table on that. And then on everything else, um, as Patrick says, um, with the amount of work coming in and, and the amount of sites they found, that was the great thing about it when we put in our objections to it, even though the objections came in late and we lost hundreds of acres probably to bulldozing. When they finally did start to monitor it, the site started popping up. So um, we've had certain areas that, that, that were maybe three to four acres, it seemed like. Uh, other ones were, were smaller. So um, we've learned a lot, although we've it's a tragic loss to all of Guam. But um, we have to live in the times we're in. So what is a normal procedure for burial? So if so you find um, human bones, what is the, the typical procedure for that one? We've started a standard operating procedure with that, with the military on that, where if they find a bone uh, of any type, then they, they, they first try to identify if it's human, and then they start put, laying out a grid of uh, one by one meters to about uh, um, 25 square meters around that bone and start clearing that area to sift it to see what we have. We have more um, of the remains, whether they were um, actually uh, hit in um, perhaps uh, during a, um, uh, you could say prior to World War II, during World War II, or maybe during the 50s when they built the army base. And so, you know, a lot of times we'll have spread if, if it got hit or plowed through or something like that, it usually moves probably 15 to 20 meters. Artifacts usually don't go that far from where they're at. And so the same way with the individual, he would get raped, but he wouldn't go that far. And so we start out from that area with a 25 meter block. And then they can, if they find more, they continue out until, uh, until they get at least to have two negative one meter by one meter blocks kind of separates that out from from that area there. Yeah, so so there have been um, in different areas of what is uh, now Camp Loss. I, I, I too, like Dave Lotz, don't like to call it by, by letters and numbers. I prefer to call it by the names that they were or will be. Um, so I have a hard time calling it J001B or J755. Um, I call it like it is. Um, there is one burial that has come about that they are still uh, studying as we speak. I think it's an extraordinary finding that will, like like John Mark said, will change the landscape and the and the uh, the history of of the plateau. Um, and I think in the close upcoming future. Um, there's going to be a presentation regarding that. Um, 
The annual report, the annual meeting for the Guam build up is scheduled for August 6 or 7. It's either date, it hasn't been confirmed yet, but I anticipate by then that um, a good showing of, of that findings will be will be shared with, with the public um, at that time. Um, so in regards to uh, the cultural context, so we, you know, we, um, you know, it's important that you know, we preserve things in place, but, you know, it's as far as the footprint going beyond the site of artifacts, uh, you know, I know in the PA, the programmatic agreement, there was so-called uh, in section four, uh, they were supposed to have done interviews of traditional cultural properties sacred sites, culturally important natural resources uh, to include the, uh, the natural environment. So, and so this is supposed to be uh, provided or at least um, documented by the military. Do you have, I, you know, my office has, was not able to obtain that information. Uh, would it be possible to get that information? And I think moving forward, you know, in addition to preserving that, the site of the find, looking at the cultural context that it's in. Um, you know, what is, uh, what is the, um, you know, what is your position on that? And if, if, if it's possible, we can uh, reassess uh, this information because I feel that a lot of it was missed in the of this programmatic agreement, I think we updated just like um, you know, there's findings, new findings of adverse effects. We need to update and include this information to ensure that these areas are not just the site itself, but the context is also protected. Yes, we're total uh, in total agreement with you, Senator, on that as far as the context um, and not only within the confines of Magua and Texan, but also you know, within the whole plateau, uh, looking towards the east of that, uh, gathering the data collectively and seeing how that that could be rewritten in that aspect. Um, as far as the information that you're requiring, if your staff can just uh, shoot me an email on the data, and I'll, I'll, I'll be more than happy to try and uh, track that down for you. Okay. Um, yeah, I appreciate that because I did invite, uh, I was reaching out to landowners and other people that use, utilize the land. I think it's important, and some of them may not be living on Guam, for that matter. I think I believe you know, relocated to the state. So I think it's important to gather as much of that information because you know, as much as, as, much as the importance is of the, I think the, the cultural connection is also very valuable. So yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, okay. And as far as Appendix E, so, Appendix C, in the very beginning, in, um, in 2011, uh, there was a listing of sites, um, but every year there was supposed to be an update. Uh, what is your understanding as far as how many updated uh, appendices were created by the military? Can you repeat the question? You're, you're breaking up. Yes, so of Appendix C, e, uh, that's basically... Yes all the, the projects that are covered under the programmatic agreement. There was an initial listing in which the site MAGO was actually listed, but it wasn't known. So, um, have there been updates as a military provided updated appendices E since, since the initial one? Yeah, so the semi-annual was released, I believe in December. And then the annual is the one that uh, I referred to for August uh, six or seven. So we anticipate a, an updated uh, report come within the next couple of weeks. So that would have updated appendices to that? It should, yes. Um, so I would like to acknowledge the presence of Senator uh, Teletitically. Here, okay, okay. Um, I would also like to, I guess, I'm sure a lot of my colleagues have questions, so I do would like to open up the floor to um, Senator Therese Trelahi.
Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you to all of uh, you who've um, made presentations this morning or this afternoon. It's been uh, very informative. We've actually learned new information despite having uh, several hearings and of course meetings and uh, we continue to find new things about these places and I think that's uh, that's what it's all about is that uh, we said in the beginning we did not know everything we need to know and this is uh, these are places that should be preserved for not just us to learn as much as we can but for future generations to learn as much as they can with the uh, technology that will be available to them and so uh, the more that we can preserve in place the better uh, if I could just follow up on uh, something the Shippo said earlier is this um, you were talking about a burial and the findings would be uh, produced later are you talking about on the um, Magua site is that is that where that burial was found no okay. What site is that? Uh, area 2. It's Area 2, which is to the east, kind of east, northeast of, of Magra. Okay. All right. If and then, uh, all right. Are you, are you, are the findings available to you right now? Because there's nothing that prevents you from disclosing those, is there? What the findings are? We're, we, we're, under the same as the as with the military of, of disclosing so yeah when the, when things right now are moving with them we do not disclose you know because they ask us not to but i don't understand well, that part <laughs> on, that, on that case senator is basically at least from me from from my standpoint is um you know there we're they're still gathering information and and uh and clearing some areas that right now there's still a lot of questions, even within the archaeological uh, community. And what I want uh, personally is is to get more cl uh, clearer clearer answers prior to taking it out to uh, the community. Um, I know the uh, the governor's aware of it, um, you know, and and um, within the confines of of the preservation. Uh, archaeologists, um, they're they're studying it, and I think you'll 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 be, I think you'll um, I don't know what's the right word, but but it's an extraordinary find, and and once we have all the information that's ready to to release, um, it'll it'll be it'll be sufficient. So um, even as of Friday, they were still doing some some studies. So. Well, I'd like to um, invite you again to tell us, please, what is your understanding from what you have learned as our state historic preservation officer and our state archaeologists for the people of Guam? What is it that you have learned about this area or these these burials? So what we've learned is <clears throat> it, it wasn't a pri uh, uh, temporary um, area. It was. It looks like there were there were people who lived and occupied those lands. Um, that was a, a theory that I, I believe this office held for several years, and this just confirms that even more so, uh, along with other uh, other findings of uh, artifacts. So that yes, that's the position that that we we have. So these are tomorrow. These are tomorrow's, and do, can you tell us? Uh, what, um, how old they are? So right now the preliminary um, finding for this one burial is that it came from uh, the Latin period um, uh, based off of the bone structures. Um, and so again, that's, they, they still haven't determined the, the gender, um, but but that's that's the first um, thought process of it coming from, from the Latin period. And like I said, there's there's still uh, dialogue between you know the state archaeologists, the field archaeologists, as far as uh, getting more data and information before before we we come out and say okay, this is this is really the best picture of the findings. Um, all the theories have been placed on the table, and and this is this is what we truly believe uh, this 
one burial uh, signifies to to our Chamorro people. So we're still we're still in the process of of collecting information um, and and theorizing um, based off of what what's there. Well, you know, I'm not an archaeologist, but I've learned enough in my years just reading and uh, listening to archaeologists that uh, there is never a final word on anything. And there should never be, you know, withholding of information until we get the final, final, final answer. I just think that that denies information to the people of Guam. These are our ancestors. We want to know. And when we have been told we were wrong in the past, I would think you would be the first person to jump up and say, you know, look, we're finding new information every day that shows, you know, otherwise. And we've, uh, there were, there have been several theories, I guess you could call them theories that have been uh, proposed during these programmatic agreement annual meetings for years. And one of them was that these these plateaus actually are part of um, a way of life that, uh, you know, uh, evolve around these villages that are actually on the coastline. So while the villages are, are you know, maybe sometimes more documented or more mapped and, you know, we, we've left uh, the Lati there in place, but that these areas are all connected and they're all they show us more and more lifestyles by showing us when they use the different parts of the land and this is what I learned from another archaeologist from uh, the Taragi settlement area that they've they've um, taken into account not just the the Lati sites or you know the village the, the very close to village sites but all the way to the coastline and I've seen this also in Dr. Carson's work uh, that they describe that these are, they operate together. And so we've always said this about this um, area that we are calling um, the Mat Matana area where they, they're building the marine cantonment area. And uh, these are, they've separated these even on this, um, uh, on this, um, programmatic memo or PA memo that they want us to comment on, they separate them into three sites. And uh, this has always been, yeah, I think uh, one of the, the, the things in the process that really needs to change, that these sites are kind of manipulated and defined and limited, you know, by artifacts as opposed to by, um, by landscapes, that's one way that, that was described by Mr. Lotz earlier. Thank you, Mr. Lotz, or or by you know um, living areas and and so I'm I'm glad to hear that uh, you saying it's changed the paradigm to show that this was a more permanent settlement, and I think that just shows that when these theories are placed on the table, we we have to embrace all of them, and we cannot take any one of them off because the military told us to. I mean, it, it, it's very, very clear. When you, when you, um, yeah. is the stipulation 14 that you're describing, it's a, you want to change the programmatic agreement. And the specific change that you are proposing is to say, to preserve in place. Is that the specific amendment you're looking for? Uh, among other things, yes. So preserving place uh, based off what is is uh, uh, based off of the property that they're they're looking for the the, the large uh, firing range. Um, not only preserving place, but also more stringent requirements as far as uh, monitoring. Um, even even looking at the the lidar, that was that was something that came up uh, with us um, quite some time ago. Um, and just implementing probably the most strictest uh, requirements that that we can place on archaeology archaeological wise um, from a project on Guam. So, so uh, you know, prior to that, I know they have not uh, gone out for bid. Is what I hear. Uh, so what I want to do is catch that before that happens, as far as placing that uh, required amendment. Um, and again, like I said, you know, uh, I think it was your idea to to get some uh, legal representation. We finally got that in, uh, with with AG's office. 
and we're working closely with them to make sure that all the, the legalities are taken care of. Are you are, are you talking about uh, a specific area Pardon me. for the pro the build up programmatic agreement? Yes, ma'am. For, for all of the it, right? Yes. Okay. So, so when you're saying um, well, in particular, in particular, in particular to the 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 the, the next firing range that they're trying to clear out. Okay. Because a programmatic agreement, yes. the theme the theme was, of course, avoidance. But yeah, of course, we've always known we're unable to enforce uh, non of you know or um, do anything if they do not avoid, except to bring it to our attention. And this is yeah where we rely on the shipo's office very much to bring to our attention when they are not avoiding. Um, so we want to ask them to preserve in place. Specific sites or all sites that they find? I mean, because that, that's supposed to be part of the agreement already. But, yep, yeah, sorry, say that one more time. What are we asking them to preserve in place? So the, the large the, the large um, firing range that they have yet cleared. So that's right. that's the next step in okay. their, their build-up. Yes. All right. I very much appreciate that request. Yes, that uh, they preserve that. The that, uh, um, Northwest Field, the... Uh, the cliff line above the Texan, correct? Correct. Can you tell yes, us about the findings of uh, human, human, um, or burial or bones uh, up there at uh, in that in those areas that were cleared for the the other firing ranges? Have you had findings on those? Right. Uh, well, we've had certain um, remains, and, and mainly at the time when they found them, they were. Um, small um, fragments. bone fragments yeah. that they found probably most likely that that were um, when they cleared it in the 50s these individuals that were hit um, they were impacted at that point in time and so the the bones and they were finding small fragments of them uh, from that um, and we've been uh, collecting those and noting those throughout the area have they, I thought you were, um, that's what we were told when they first, um, you know, picked them up, but I, as there, there are no other um, more detailed findings to be expected on that? No. Uh, okay, can I go back to the find uh, the findings in the other, the area where you said they, the, we're going to have a significant findings from the burials, is that a, um, is that one of the areas that they are inviting comments on? I mean, or that they have listed in the, you know, in their review of this area. You mean for uh, the, um, I'm trying to think of the project, the P715? Uh, no, okay, go back, to, go back to the main cantonment area. They've sent out a right. PMOP-107, and in mm -hmm. that, they described three historic sites. So it's, it's were those findings on one of these uh, historic sites or, or another place? Right, no, no. Uh, it was near one of those sites. Um, uh, I don't think it was that exactly impacting that exact one. The other ones, I do believe, have been uh, uh, totally, or not totally, but partially data recovered at this point in time. And other ones that they're still working on or either have been already uh, recovered and, and um, annihilated from the landscape. Data, data recovery is a destructive method in itself. Absolutely. Yes, I, I guess I, I wanna ask you, is there, it, can we ask to preserve these in place? Or is it too late for that now? Or can this so the is ones what that been, asked for more? Yeah, the ones that have been, yeah, the ones that have been extracted. It's 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 been removed. Um, this one burial, um, I've made it a point that it will not be removed. Uh, that this will be preserved in place to to respect and and leave this individual um, at its final resting. Place upon just the initial um, the initial basic reports or information that we can gather, we can, like you said, uh, Senator, we can take this and and study it until 
you know, and pull DNA and all of that stuff. And that's not the intent right now. Um, however, I think, I think we're, you know, we should be, we should be done soon as far as the, the study of it, at least the, the preliminary and primary studies, at least the gender, uh, approximate age of the individual, um, and, and of course the, the, the period of, of where they come from. And then, um, to my understanding that they were, uh, that area of, of the findings was going to be a parking lot for, for the Marines. And I told them to move their parking lot. Um, so, you know, and, and respect that one burial that we found, um, the governor came out and took a look and she asked if there was other burials around the area. And that's unknown, uh, based off of, you know, the, the, what has been done in the past. Uh, but with this one particular one, I, I think we're going to, you know, I don't think I know that they're not going to remove it. And I know that we're going to, we're going to, we're going to enforce the, the preservation in place and, and put together a nice reburial monument. In fact, we're the, one of the um, options, I, I think John Mark brought it up is, you know, having the other uh, bone fragments that were found from the other sites within within the area to come in and rebury them with this one uh, one um, full remains and have one nice um, reburial monument. So those are the things that we're working um, with them, um, and and uh, you know I, I I think we're we're moving along in in that manner. All right. Well. Yeah, our, our law right now does recognize that reburying uh, is um, what we want if they have been removed. However, I think the priority has always been and should still remain not to disturb them while they are um, yes. where they are buried. And uh, do you believe when uh, you say the paradigm has shifted that uh, these sites are connected to Haputo um, and the uh, other historic sites on the cliff. Oh, uh, most definitely, most definitely. I, I, I it, it's like my, I live in Maina. I, I know people in Ganya Heights and Sinahanya. So, you know, it, we're a community. Uh, they know me and they know when I travel through and I know them when they travel through. So, um, uh, it's not that these people lived in isolation. They were a part of the largest community that lived down below. Um, they had uh, a certain uh, role to play in, in, in society with the, the, what they were growing up on the hill and, and all that. And then they supplied that, that food to the people below, I'm sure. They probably had a pretty good uh, trade um, thing going on. And, and you had different individuals uh, probably uh, up top that were, you know, in charge and, um, you know, same hence, as down below. Hence the uh, the findings of some fishbone in, in those areas as well. So it makes sense. Yes. And just to be clear, so we saw pictures earlier. Of, well, uh, before I say that, Mr. Carson, Dr. Carson, could you please um, describe that type of um, connection for the Lefexan area? I know I've heard you talk about this before. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> yes, it, certainly. Um, <clears throat> now, just to, I believe we're, the archaeologists mostly would be in consensus about this with what you've been saying. That uh, <clears throat> we, when we look at um, the archaeology of Guam, uh, ever since people were living in the islands, it was, well, was permanent. So when we find something that someone says is a temporary shelter or a temporary habitation, that's a little bit of a, of a illogical conclusion because of course people are living permanently in the island. So whatever you find is related with something that is a, a permanent large-scale village settlement. So in, in that sense, uh, when we find something in, a, in an unlikely place, right? So it, it looks like it's this inhospitable place on the upper limestone plateau. There's very little water resources. What are people doing up here? Well, in fact, it is related with 
the, the village settlement. And as um, Dave Lotz mentioned earlier, the, the importance of finding the bamboo groves still growing in some places indicates that, in, in fact, there is an ability to tap into these water resources. And that means, well, some patches and places that we think are inhospitable upper limestone plateau, in, in fact, are more useful than we might think they are. And, and also, uh, things change through time with a uh, climate reliability of rainfall, the, the depth of the water table that people can access, those, those things change through time. Uh, so the, the conditions that we see on the surface right now are not necessarily reflective of a site that existed there, say, 500 years ago. Definitely not what existed there 2,000 years ago or 3,000 years ago. So we need, need to keep all those things in mind. Now, uh, all that being said, um, <clears throat> the work around the, the Latexan area was, was quite instructive because we could look at a very large area from the coast all the way up through the, those plateau and find um, <clears throat> that during each period of time, going back thousands of years, we could see that multiple localities were used for, for different reasons, um, but throughout those time periods. Like for example, a place would have been used for accessing water, but not necessarily as, as a residential site. And then later on, we would see it being used in a different way. And, and the landscape changes through time, but you could imagine living now, you are aware of what people did a few generations ago. And the people a few generations ago would have been aware of what happened before that. So through time, you could imagine a landscape evolving with its natural history and its cultural history that, that really are in, interconnected. You know, we shouldn't try to separate those two. So in that sense, when, when, whenever we find the physical remains of an archeological site, like, like at, at Mogwag or uh, in the clearings of the, the um, firing range area in Anderson Air Force Base, we, we should be thinking of them as part of a permanently inhabited landscape that has evolved through time up to that point of, of, of its context and, and even continuing now. So when we find something like like what um, Patrick and, and John Mark were describing, say it's a, like about a 500 year old laddie association with burials and other other materials, and it then we can think of that as not just being a 500 year old site, but it probably has much older context as as well. And at, at the time people were living there 500 years ago, they were aware of what happened before that. And they were aware of the environment, environment around them. The people living at the coast and living farther inland were, were aware of who those people were. Very much like what John Mark was describing happens in, in a modern context. So uh, these, in other words, these sites should not be just be treated in isolation as, as single footprints of themselves, and they should not necessarily be treated just within that, that, that narrow constraint. We should be thinking larger and thinking how things are interconnected. And uh, I believe we have, we have so many experts on, on this video chat right now. I want to reiterate one thing <clears throat> that in government, work, especially at a federal level, we have environmental regulations, and like, and, and then we also have, you know, historic preservation that tend to be separate. But uh, in, especially in a place like Guam, I would hope to see more more collaboration of those two. Because a, a natural resource like a water resource, or a forest is a cultural resource. And it does have a history to it. And I would, I would like to see a little more of that. And when you start thinking in that perspective, then the things that you've been mentioning, Senator, about, about the interconnections of these sites also, uh, it, it just makes more sense. And, and, and you could bring these things together in, I, I believe, a more positive way that everyone can appreciate. 
Um, so uh, did you want me to be a little more specific than that or is that enough for what you need no, now? That's good. Um, thank you very much. Um, yes, and so I just, uh, I wanna thank all of you for your work. Uh, I think the more we learn, the more, you know, valued, not, it's just not, it's of course valuable to all of us and uh, it's valuable to the Chamorro people. It's, um, it, it's going to help us, I think, to show different ways of survival of what, how they adapted. And I learned this from these archeologists and other scientists that, yeah, that, that this is how you show that they adapted over different time periods, different um, climate periods, and uh, how they were able to survive here on Guam for these thousands of years. Can I just ask one more question? I know there are others who want to speak. So, um, but uh, back, back to Patrick Lujan. The, um, so the one programmatic PA memo that they want us to comment on and the deadline to comment is July 15, which is tomorrow. This area, uh, this is the whole um, marine cantonment area, including the three you know, carved out historic sites, including the burial ground that you described. These border the, you know, the, the, um, I think they call it an archeological, uh, no, uh, uh, it's a preserve area, a biological preserve area, uh, Haputo, the cliff lines, I think they call it Pugwa Point there, and we have a, a water source up there on the cliff also, but I, um, so, I think, you know, it's clear that these are possibly all connected, right? But the project that they're proposing is um, they've already done the project to clear the area. And this is where all of these um, bones were discovered, artifacts were discovered, burials were discovered. These Lati and Lu Song were what they call data recovered, picked up and moved out of the area, no longer in its context, and moved over and stored. And um, I'm wondering if the AV has that photo ready, if they could just publish that on the screen for a few seconds. If the uh, audio staff at the legislature is able to do that. Is this the same one, uh, the one that had that orange uh, fencing? It has, yeah, with the tape, orange tape. Pardon? Is this from Dave Locke's presentation? No. No, it's one I sent to um, Amy earlier. Oh, okay. Uh, Senator Paris, I, I guess it, maybe your office has it. Okay, we'll get back to that one later. If you could show that a, a little later when you have it ready. Um, Familiar uh, with that. Um, my, my question is, yes, these, um, we're talking not just, you know, pieces of pottery that were picked up and moved, but they picked up and moved Lati Stone, Lu Song, and they moved them and they pretty much piled them all in an area um, that we've been to. And uh, it's right near the baseball field there at the, you know, uh, where the, um, many people gathered, I think it was last weekend or the weekend before that to, to you know, say these are our ancestors' homelands. And it's not, yeah, I guess I just wanted to show that it's not just, you know, small pieces of artifacts. It's, we're moving ancient villages and moving them, just clearing them. Here it is. So here's a picture of what was described to us as some of the Lati and some of the Lusong from the Magua area. And these are together with uh, some of the Lati and the Lusong from other areas here at this uh, naval cantonment area. Is that correct, uh, Mr. Lujan? Or That's Dunbar? correct. Yeah, yeah, yes, it is. 
And, and actually, in the history of uh, Magua, if you go back to the 1913-1914 maps, it, it, Magua is at an intersection of uh, perhaps four, four roads. Uh, and during the 1950s, when you compare it to the 1950s map, uh, well, 1944 map shows it in the same place. And then in 1950, when they built the base, Magua residents and all moved down probably uh, a half mile. So the, it was abandoned probably during the 50s, um, uh, mainly, I guess, because of the military buildup at that time. I think it's a 1954 map shows it um, moved down to approximately a... Um, uh, half, probably a mile, I think, below where its uh, location originally was. Yeah, but going going back to your the, the picture, ma'am. Uh, so, upon my first site visit uh, back on the job last summer, I, I visited this this particular area. Um, wasn't too too keen on it. I wasn't happy about it, and 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 I requested for immediate uh, um, relocation and protection. So. They've assured me that that's that's uh, under not not exposed. Um, obviously, it's been exposed for for so many years, but they have protected it uh, in a uh, indoor facility until until either the repository or the visitor center that is also being talked about uh, is built. Thank you. Thank you for. Um, you can take the picture down now. I just. This just upsets me very much because um, I just can't see the value in looking at a lati stone that has been removed from the place where where it was used. Um, for me, for for any any generation of ours. Um, but okay, my final question then is: They are proposing. Uh, they said an area distribution nodes and site telecom cabling project. This is the design and construction phase for these cabling projects. Do you use, this involves um, additional grading, digging, trenching, drilling, boring, and are cut to fill to construct uh, two-story ADNs along with site improvements, pavement, uh, parking, drainage, utility systems. Um, do you expect that this will cause additional uh, damage to known and unknown archaeological sites? Or or I don't even want to call them that at this point. Um, parts of this, you know, um, extensive living area. Right. Uh, the uh, the uh, project that you're describing now is on top of the footprint of the main cantonment area where they've been doing excavations uh, since um, I think they started in uh, 2018. And so we, you know, our objections finally got in um, in um, I think it was May of uh, 2018. Um, yeah, uh, May of 2018. So what we've been doing now is finding those sites that were not known from the previous archaeological studies. You know, they, they were not sticking the shovel in the ground and they walked right over the site and never saw it. And so um, here on this area, most of the work has already been done for the main cantonment. And like you said, this is the parking lot areas and stuff like that. Although uh, on this one area, we're asking it for to be preserved in place. And we're working that now to preserve that in place. So it's not going to all be uh, the main containment as it is. We're going to have this area here preserved in place. If we run across anything else, we're, we're going with that same type of objection to preserve it in place. Um, at this point in time, most of the work on most of the sites have been completed. We've got uh, their, their end of field work um, reports. I haven't got totally what I want. I never do, apparently, but I fight for what I can get. So um, it's, it's one of those things I'm fighting for the people of Guam. I'm fighting for that history, and I'm fighting to preserve, avoid it at all costs. 
Thank you. I appreciate that. And I'd like to get your commitment, if I could, uh, you know, Mr. Lujan, if, to, to um, I'm, I'm still very glad the governor is being briefed on these findings. And, but I, I really believe timely briefing of all the people of Guam is going to benefit them. It's going to give you, you know, maybe additional knowledge that, that could also be added, you know, on the table as you described it. Uh, because, you know, there's been people who witnessed these things and, and grew up in these areas and all any information I think is, is uh, belongs to all of us. It should be shared with all of us timely. And you don't have to say you have a formal conclusion as to what it might be, but you can put up the theories as to, you know, these are some theories being considered. I, I see no harm in that type of disclosure. I'd also like to ask that, um, but I want to commend you for your stance on uh, preservation in place that there really was supposed to be the whole premise of the entire programmatic agreement. And that's why that disclosure was so important. So if we know about it, we can preserve it in place. But even when they knew about it, they did not do that. Obviously, with these Lati, where the Lati villages were. But um, one more thing I'd like to get a commitment from you on is so, so these programmatic annual meetings, uh, the next one coming up in August was rescheduled due to the COVID pandemic. Can we get a commitment that that will be open? Um, in the past, it's only been by invitation. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, the information that's shared there, uh, other people would really like to hear it firsthand from the sources that are sharing it. And um, yeah, so I, I'd like to ask you to please um, try to accommodate sure. that. Again, you are our signatory on the programmatic, or, you know, your predecessor at the, your office is the signatory on this programmatic agreement. So technically, our, you know, very few representatives from the people of Guam are, are parties in, in that agreement. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And, and, and uh, just to... Um, to answer those, um, so yes, the annual was supposed to be in May, but because of COVID, it's pushed back to August. Um, obviously, for social distancing uh, reasons, I believe they're, they're, they're trying to procure the uh, Adeloop uh, conference room because they already have the te technology uh, to do it uh, virtual with no more than 10 people within the room. Uh, but yes, they it will be open to the public uh, virtually, obviously, uh, in regards to that. Um, and, and I do assure you, and I, I give you my pledge that I will continue to, to fight for what's right when it comes to cultural resources and the preservation of it, what, what little left we have on our island. Um, and, and, uh, on a daily basis, myself and, and John Mark are, are fighting in here for that. Uh, we, we debate daily. We, we, um, but we're, we're on the same page, uh, as far as what we need to do. Uh, there's a lot of, in the past, uh, I guess, enough fingers to point of what went wrong, but, but that's, that's neither here nor there. And, and you know, we're going to do what we need to do uh, from today and moving forward. All right. I, I'm sad to hear about the 10-person limit, but um, I hope you can keep advocating to open that up. I, I'm very disappointed, especially if I'm not going to be able to participate because um, well, I, want, I want people, to call Frank, frankly, yeah, I people, appreciate that opportunity to be able to call them on these things and to tie, to beg them pretty much to tie these things together and to stop treating them like simply artifacts. Thank you very much. Yeah, Thank you. 10, people in, 10 people in place, uh, in person, and then I guess everybody else that's invited, it's uh, by virtual. All right. Thank so. you. Thank you, Senator Terlaki. Uh, Senator Kelly Marsh Paitano, you're recognized. I do a small team, Madam Chair. And if I could make a pitch for, I know we have a lot of larger locations on island. Um, we have them at the University of Guam where in the administrative building, something there might be set up so that we could have more people in, in actual physical attendance. Because I do agree that at least for immediate like this, a workshop like this, that uh, being there physically, uh, since since it's going to happen to a degree physically, if we can enlarge that, I think it will be better for everybody to be able to have some of that uh, in-place dialogue. 
but um, I, I want to start off and just kind of remind everybody um, because a lot of times perhaps when people think about adverse impacts, which I agree completely the people that have said it here before, that we, it, it almost, it, the jargon almost becomes a way of distancing ourselves from the actual. Mitigation means that there's harm that's happening. Um, adverse effect, it doesn't sound so negative, but it can be, it is a negative effect first and foremost, and then it can be quite a devastating effect. And so when we hear about these adverse impacts or these adverse effects, just to remind or for those that are less familiar that it isn't just physical damage. It can be, we're supposed to be looking at soundscapes, at view sheds, so we can be looking at noise, at vibration, at visual impacts, and then of course direct impacts. And this is some of what uh, I feel was in, in the reports that some of this just didn't get assessed as much as it should have as far as the significance of this impact. It doesn't take much at all to look around online and find all kinds of examples about when we're talking about sacred spaces. So here we have at Latexan and the area above it, whether it was part of Latexan as Tailalo or if it was uh, a whole nother area that had a trading relationship, that these are some of our oldest sites in the archipelago. And the, the thought of as many as 6.7 million bullets being shot above that, you know, to me, being in that sacred ground, being above that sacred ground, it, it definitely hits some of those points of noise impacts to sacred sites, um, vibration, and even if it's one in a million bullets, when we're talking about 6.7 million bullets a year, we're talking about the possibility of six or seven bullets making it over that berm and hitting something below, which it's it's pretty much, Dr. Carson correct, can correct me there, but uh, down below it, uh, down below those firing ranges, pretty much uh, all village uh, in one direction. And then we have another village or two in another direction um, of Panaps and areas like that. But I just wanted to kind of provide that for maybe those who are listening in that would, would not have been aware of that. And well, yeah, I'll, I'll kind of leave it at that without going in too much uh, in that direction. But um, I wanted to ask about our participation because it seems like in, in one hand, there are these PMA, PA memos that come out and then they're asking for input. And I realize that there's responsibility on more than one end to be able to, to get to those PA memos um, and, and to be able to comment. But it, it's constantly been going through my mind how we can improve that process. So I wanna ask a few questions about the type of public input that is occurring, and then uh, to, to explore a little bit how we might improve it. So there are different levels of community input that are to be going on. At the very beginning of the process, we have these consulting parties. And so while the, the project and the programmatic agreement are, are getting together, um, they should be weighing in and then we also have interested parties where it's supposed to be a fundamental goal in the process to have these interested parties be able to identify and evaluate the historic properties or ancestral heritage to use a, a term that 
it's more evocative of how we might feel about those sites or historic sites, right? It's not just all ancestral. Some of it at part is dealing with historic sites. Um, and then there became an issue about having to be a, a concurring party to still be able to be part of this process that one had to sign on and actually agree to this process. And it became very problematic because that term concurring um, it just was something that a lot of people felt uncomfortable with or a lot of groups felt uncomfortable with. They did not want to concur with everything that necessarily was going on in the programmatic agreement is they, you know, they, they were wanting more involvement and in, in different parts to the agreement. So in this, I'm putting the programmatic agreement together. We're taking a very complex set of project situations. We're taking numerous projects and we're trying to come up with a pathway. Uh, to simplify, right? And in that simplification, if I can ask the SHPO, where do where do interested parties, uh, so those who might be very much tied into what's going on in one way or the other, uh, how are interested parties involved in this ongoing part of the process because of the programmatic agreement. Okay, good question, uh, Senator. And I'll I'll start with an answer. And I know John Mark wants to chime in on on this, but uh, the way that we have been um, carrying forth with those interested parties that have been identified in previous programmatic agreements uh, really is is when we have some type of conflict on a decision with them that we uh, we CC them, right? As f to, to, to make sure that they're involved uh, in any type of uh, either, either conflicting uh, uh, review or something, you know, that's in uh, large, but, but pretty much if, if we are in concurrence um, and in agreement, then, then normally we just we just go uh, party to party, um, and and John Mark, if you want to chime in on, on that on how we determine Is how to get the party to party. Do you mean the concurring parties that have already agreed and signed on to the PA? No, party to party would be our, us and and the Navy. Okay, so just the the two main entities. Correct. Yeah. Right. So uh, as we all had a problem with the concurring party aspect of it and the, and the name of that, it is the language that is written in in Section 106. And so the, I know that we couldn't get around that as far as that goes. And then a lot of people didn't sign on because the, they didn't want to be a concurring party. But like it was explained with ACHP, the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, is that is the language that was used in the thing. So it was it didn't mean that you concurred with it. It gave you a chance to have a voice and participate in. Uh, that being said, we are where we are now with the concurring parties and all that. I don't know if the, we can do an amendment to open it up or if they'll change that. But as as time changes, we're we're all seem seeming to find a different voice on different levels. So you know, it's always something that we can in our annual meetings that we can go back to and and see and um, open up a perhaps you know a dialogue to perhaps change that to let more people in. And I I know I do know that uh, there can be instances. Um, I mean, well, first of all, every, any, you know, anything's kind of possible, but second of all, that there, ha there have been instances where they are willing to open that back up. So um, if, if there are groups out there, they may be interested in, in applying, like writing a letter of interest and, and possibly asking if they can be um, a consulting party although it may mean that they need to sign it as a concurring party, but if they're, if they're willing to go through those steps, 
there do seem to be indications that they could open that up. And I guess part of what I'm looking at is, it just feels to me um, that if we had taken each project individually, there would have been more, uh, it, it seems like, and, and you can walk me through the process, but it seems like there would have been more um, tackling per, per project of identifying particular interested parties per that project. So is that still going on? Like if um, they're addressing something in the cantonment, is there effort made by them or your office to find interested parties? I know that there are original landowners or people who grew up in that area uh, and things like that uh, to, to reach out to. Right. If I may, um, and, and, the, and the, the sad fact is, is that um, we do not seem to be getting much public input. We have the um, PA memos here for the public. Um, the, they're here. The Navy has them on their website. They can pick them up. They can come in, put in a request for assistance, talk with us. You know, you know, uh, ask for advice there. Um, we just don't see that. I've got I've got a ton of PA memos that no one has come in to comment on, and and and, and to me that's a tragedy. Um, I I know there are people out there that are caring. I also um, asked the Navy to perhaps um, work a better website or whatever to where they could get people can get information and uh, maybe maybe that's a fault of us all is that we're not spreading that word and getting that to those people that need it um, I cannot I can't you know I've got a ton of work to do so I can't go out on the streets and hand them out but their office is always open we always have them for them and uh, perhaps uh, maybe as we come about um, in, in this next um, annual meeting here, we should perhaps bring that up that we, we need more, um, I guess, visual in the paper, you know, perhaps in the, in the um, variety in the, um, uh, in the post there um, to get that, uh, get the word out to the people. Um, that, that's the main thing is, is to keep the people informed and, 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 and uh, you know, have the projects or whatever in the spotlight. Now, not everybody wants them in the spotlight, but as far as I'm concerned, the more ideas, the flow of information we have, the better off we are with the community. Same way with the coronavirus, the more information we know about it and all that, the better off we're going to be. Me and Patrick are sitting here with their masks on. You know, um, it, it's one of those things. It's very real to us on both, both cases there. I mean, the other thing, I, and, and like John Mark, just to uh, reiterate on the on the PA memos, um, maybe there's there's a better way of, of communicating that. Um, you know, we we found somewhere, uh, you know, the dates were wrong or the months were wrong, and we'll catch those little nuances. Uh, I mean, those are those are little technical things, but still, you know, it goes a long way as far as showing the importance and the and the. Uh, um, the meaning behind it, right? So, you know, that's that's definitely something that we can we can bring up to them and, and improve on. Yeah, you know, um, I, I definitely think there can be improvements on both sides. Um, with 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 the military, I I definitely think that there can be improvements. But you know, we do have a military affairs office, and. Um, Quite frankly, I need to learn more about them and, and learn what all of their tasks are to understand if this can fit within what they, what they provide, or maybe it can be a partnership between the SHPO and, and them. But the, the way that the PO, PA memos are, so it's, I, I don't know how to describe it any other way than it's cumbersome, it's overwhelming. Um, and and it, it's it's very difficult. Like one has to make a concerted effort to check that website, perhaps on the daily basis, 
and to try to keep up with all the deadlines and all the information. And um, it's very specific. And quite frankly, with these uh, comments, having participated in the process uh, quite a lot and, and heard people talk about their participation and, and so forth, I really, really think that we need to have some sort of program where this program, again, I don't know if military affairs is the right fit or if it's a, a combination, if it comes out of the civilian military council or commission, uh, whatever, whichever is the right term, council is the right term for it. But something, I mean, we have two channels. We have a legislative channel, we have a governor's channel that somebody needs to make sure in a very simple format that they just get on that channel and people, people watch those channels all the time. Uh, we all know it because people come up to us and, and, and talk to us about the things that go on those channels. But to get that information out there, but not only that, to have this awareness pack campaign, what are public comments? What, why are they even asked for? And to walk them through because public comments, if they're not substantive, it's, all of them are important. So I don't want to discourage anybody. All of them are important, but they need to be substantive in order to make the most impact. And most of us, myself included, I'm still learning how to make it substantive enough to get the kind of results that our community deserves. And so I think we need a real program. And, and maybe before that annual workshop or uh, during that annual workshop, annual workshop, we really need to push for this. Because telling 160,000 people that aren't, haven't been trained, aren't necessarily aware, it's a disservice to them to have this process supposedly taking their, their input and without really giving them the tools for it. There are a few specialists and we appreciate them. There are many of them are right here, so I appreciate all of you incredibly. And, and it's a, you know, it's additional something for all of you to do when you do your part. But we all know that there's so much oral history out there. There's so much generational knowledge out there about our own land, about our own history. What came up in one of them more recently was, where was Angel Santos's uh, grandfather's ranch? And then people were, from my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it kind of looked like people were doing the hot lemai or hot potato with it. It was like, well, you need to look it up. No, somebody else needs to look it up. And it's like, wait a minute, we, we need to know this as a community. So we have all kinds of knowledge and information and, and cultural values that need to be heard in these. So, you know, I would really push for those. You've probably sat um, for the, the SHPO or even uh, Romina King, if she's here. Uh, sorry, I have my, my screen is split in half, so I only get to see half of the people at the time, so I can look at my notes as well. But are these some of the things that come up or can come up in that, in that civilian military council? Is this things that you guys can address as well? If I may, we've already asked a question about Angel Santos's um, farm, um, and you know we we got the thing that uh, uh, well we really don't know where he was at, and then we got the thing well he was on the wrong spot, but they arrested him on that spot, and from my understanding is his mother's still alive, so you could ask Mrs. Santos where the farm was. I'm sure she knows where her father's farm was. Um, a lot of these questions are, like you said, it is just basic doing the doing the work and going out to the field and getting it from the people firsthand that have the information and have them write it down. I'm sure she yeah. has mapped everything of where that property was. So things like that and and for Angel and and uh, uh, the work that he did and um, all and that needs to be um, memorialized. You know, we, we have it in a park, but uh, it needs to keep, stay alive. You know what I mean? That, that yeah. voice no, that he had. That's an important part of our know, history. I completely agree. Yeah, that, that site is very salient, um, both for his grandfather's time and, and for his time. Um, it's important 
incredibly important to our history. I, I do want to, um, I think Senator Sabina wanted to let somebody testify. Maybe it's related to this or maybe they have to go. So I, I'll, I'll continue this, but I, I do want to defer to uh, somebody who may need to make a statement. Yes, so thank you, Senator. Kelly. I, I apologize for interrupting your line of questioning and thank you for so much for that line of questioning. I think it's very important to, you know, have the public become more meaningful, meaningfully involved in the process and not just when these PO memos come out, but in the very early stages. And um, yeah, that just goes to show and from our experience that, um, you know, there's something deficient in the process where you end up having destruction of these sites. So um, I would like to invite, I know um, Julia Fay, she's, I think it's a really another time zone. So I know uh, you have, uh, you know, you can uh, present your testimony. Oh, uh, uh, Senator Kelly, uh, I can go if, if people would like, uh, but I'm also fine um, going whenever, but I, I can go. Um, um, so um, I guess I can start. Kapade Guahu si Julia Femanyos, Sizuas Masi, for the opportunity to give testimony today on behalf of Ihagan Famalao and Guahan. Ihagan Famalao and Guahan works from the collective mission to enhance, promote, protect, and foster the social, economic, cultural, spiritual, and political well being of Chamorro women girls, and gender diverse people within the overall Guahan community. Ihagan Famalao and Guahan opposes the latest, latest project J17, which is the ongoing surveying and construction of area distribution nodes and telecom cabling on the Magua ancient village Ladi site in NCTS Finagadzan area of Northern Guam. Project J-17 has required the clearing of three historic sites eligible for the National Register of Historic Places and extends into the area where Magua was cleared. The clearing of these sites entails the destruction of sacred Chamorro lands, including the desecration of the remains of our ancestors and the removal of culturally and historically significant artifacts. The whereabouts of the discovered ancestral remains and artifacts have yet to be made transparent by DOD, who has made none to minimal efforts to protect and preserve these remains and artifacts in their process of data recovery. We are concerned by the developmental impact and consequent contamination upon our environmental resources, including our aquifer, which supplies about 80% of our island's drinking water. We are dissatisfied with the PA memo process as DOD's determination that the design and construction of this process will not affect historic properties is clearly erroneous and lacks comprehensive information and mitigation plans regarding the clearings. Additionally, the comment period succeeding the clearing of these ancient sites is a blatant disregard by DOD of both the sacredness of our land and of the will of our people in protecting and defending these spaces. Spaces intrinsic to our cultural identity and overall welfare. Honoring our matrilineal roots and protecting our island and people, Ihagan Famalao and Guahan believes in the sacredness of our lands and waters and in respecting the burial grounds of our ancestors. We hold deep our responsibility and reverence to our ancestors in the spirit of respect to, respectfulness, dinatnya, togetherness, and anathematic harmony. We recognize the vital importance of history and our collective identity as a people, as we find healing and restoration from historical traumas. The knowledge that is embedded in the villages of Latexan and Magua has survived multiple colonizations of the Chamorro people. When the relocation of Marines to Guam is prioritized over the knowledge and history of our cultural past and the well being of our environment, we are sending a message to our people, our women, our girls, our children, that wartime violence is more important than our cultural heritage, our legacy, and the integrity of our environment. We believe in the core Chamorro value of Fat Tao Tao, to treat others with utmost respect as a member of humanity, and the Chamorro people have not been respected by DOD in the clearing and devastation of our lands, heritage, and resources. 
the recklessness of Project J-17 that circumvents hearing and weighing in the voices of the Chamorro people is in plain sight for all to see. In light of DOD's actions and the rapid decimation of our lands and waters, Ihagan Famalawan Guahan echoes the sentiments of members of our island community to protect these spaces. We urge that the cleared sites should be considered as eligible under criterion A, B, and C of the National Register, Register of Historic Places, in addition to criterion D. We urge Shippo Luhan to exercise his power in advocating for this designation and ensuring that the preservation of our cultural and historic sites and any future build up projects to come. Furthermore, Ihagan Famalawan Guahan urges our community to continually reflect, learn, and become socially and environmentally conscious of the ways in which our island and people are affected by the continued militarization of our lands and waters upon which we live. We call on our local community and its leaders to submit comments regarding Project J-17 by July 15, 2020 to CRI web comment at navy.mil. Undankula nasi zuas maasi. Thank you so much, Julia. Um, and I believe um, Victoria Leoncarero um, is uh, also, she has a commitment, so I would like to give her the opportunity to, to speak to as well. Hafidi, Sitos Masi, Senator Perez, and all the um, leaders who are here today, uh, thank you so much for holding this very important hearing. Um, today I'm representing Independent Guahan uh, and also just speaking as a Chamorro daughter and uh, deeply concerned mother about this situation. Um, just for some context, Independent Guahan empowers the Chamorro people to reclaim our sovereignty as a nation. Inspired by the strength of our ancestors and with love for future generations, we educate and unify all who call our island home to build a sustainable and prosperous independent future. Um, today, we read in the Pacific Daily News that a total of 15 sites containing human remains and 28 sites containing historic artifacts which when we actually look at um, the details of in this, in this current memo that we are asking, or that our comment is being sought on, are very significant. It has been incredibly inf offensive to be told that a site which had been theorized as being temporary was not important. I'm glad to hear today that um, more clarity is being given about the significance of this area, that none of these sites are, are unimportant to us and who we are as a people, and that this entire hearing has reminded us as a community of the value of sovereignty. The fact that we don't have a voice in this process beyond leaving comments that are largely disregarded or not considered have done nothing to change the plans. The fact that uh, community groups urged our governor and our, our legislature responded in kind with the resolution urging a, a pause in construction so that we we can evaluate this area as indigenous people and determine its significance on our terms was disregarded. Uh, the fact that um, it sounds like from their testimony, the SHPO's office seems overwhelmed to the point where if you missed a deadline to object and that objection wasn't heard, uh, we couldn't protect properties that then were destroyed and that you potentially could have objected to. Uh, that's very upsetting to me. Um, I believe that, you know, the, the PA memo from the, or the, the programmatic agreement, I'm sorry, uh, from the very beginning was something our community, many of our community members refused to sign because none of these actions are acceptable to us as an indigenous people. In fact, they are in direct violation of our right. Um, our rights to maintain, protect, and develop the past, present, and future manis manifestations of our cultures, such as archaeological and historical sites, artifacts, designs, ceremonies, technologies, and visual and performing arts and literature, is spelled out verbatim, as I said it, in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. We have a right to these properties. We have a right to say, no, you cannot destroy them. And we have a right to be given more than just comments on a PA memo, we have a right as indigenous people to stop this construction and destruction of our historic properties. Um, I urge the SHPO's office to continue to use stronger language. Today I heard 
for the first time in a long time, preservation in place, though the community has been crying for this for since it was revealed of this destruction that we do not want to see more images like the one Senator Terlahi shared of Lati and Lucen just quartered off that way. Uh, what value is that to our community for that to be disrespected with such disregard for how we treat these spaces? I bring my children to these spaces to pray, to learn about who they are, and to think that because these military fences and this unjust continued colonization allows them to make these decisions about how to treat these properties that we can't see, we can't experience anymore is wrong. And so, you know, on behalf of Independent Guahan, the reminder that I want to leave with all of us today is that we need sovereignty. This is why our political status must change. So long as we are in an unincorporated territory status that does not allow us to stop actions like this, which are deeply offensive and harmful to us as a people, then all of this is for naught because we're, we're sitting around talking about things that we are being reminded daily we have no power to stop. And so, um, you know, as much as we can, um, in the spaces where we can resist this destruction, we must, enough is enough. Uh, people have regularly said, well, look at all these other sites that have been destroyed. That doesn't justify continued destruction. We've known for a very long time that the northern part of Guam was inhabited since the very beginning of human settlement to this island. It is incredibly important. As Dr. Carson shared, these are villages that work together. There are ways in which all of these pieces tell a larger story that we haven't even learned yet. And we have the right to learn who we are as a people from these places. We will not learn these things if they are bulldozed and packaged up and put in a cultural repository out of the context of, of where our ancestors actually lived uh, and not because we want to build parking lots and build bases and build firing ranges for war, to practice for war. That's not what our ancestors wanted us to do with these lands. And I'm just, I'm, I had prepared a statement, but I'm incredibly moved by uh, the spirit of powerlessness in a lot of this conversation today. And I hope that we can change that. I, I think that there's a lot of politeness around what can or can't be disclosed because we're working with the military. These are not military properties. They have been occupied. They were stolen from the people of Guam and the historic uh, information, the cultural resources, the spiritual value of these places belong to the Chamorro people. And if we don't understand that and recognize that all of you as elected officials and as appointed officials in positions that are supposed to be protecting these spaces, if you don't recognize that you are accountable to not just the people of Guam, but also to the Chamorro people of Guam who have indigenous rights to these areas, then I highly recommend that you reconsider your, your position because we are looking to you to be our voice and we don't know enough. And you know, those, the few of us that keep up with this are burdened by it. We, how can we even begin to keep up? How many more comments do I have to leave on military documents to see change? Nothing has changed and enough is enough. And I'll leave it at that. So Sizo Smaasi for everybody's time. Uh, I thank you for the hard work that you're doing and I hope that we can all work together to do better and to become sovereign as a people. Thank you, Zeus Masi, Victoria. Can I add to that? Um, yes. Thank you. So, I, you know, I, I'm moved by, by the passion of this group. Um, I too am passionate of, of, of preservation on, on our island. And and Victoria made a point of, of us being overwhelmed and. And I know the focus on this discussion is on the military buildup, but imagine, you know, looking at the entire island and the encompassing uh, um, preservation of our island from Don Jose's property down at Talfofo and, and, you know, the Japanese development down at Tumon. We're fighting, we're fighting a battle here in the office. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think this is a, a good, um, a good area to say, you know, that that we need help, 
And, you know, you guys are always, I've, I've spoke to each and every one of you last year that my door is always open. You're always welcome to come in and ask questions and get information. Uh, we do need to work as a team. We do need to approach this truly as a one Guam stance, uh, not just against the military, but help us. Um, I've got some ideas that we can talk on, a, on, a, on another meeting of how we can strengthen our, our true preservation. And it's not only, you know, facing the military, but, you know, the, the, the local landowners, the local developers, uh, the commercial side, uh, it, it's a lot. It's a lot that, that we face on a daily basis, um, and, and I appreciate all of you guys' um, concerns, and I, I plead for your help in that so we can we can continue to have a one Guam preservation approach. Thank you. So, um, Patrick, if I could just ask a follow-up question. If we wanted to stop a project, would that be done to the Shippo's office? Um, it, it would, stopping a project is... Uh, it's a peculiar statement to say. Um, we have to look at what what is there from a cultural resource standpoint to even have any type of of, of effect on a project. Um, we can't just arbitrarily stop a project. Um, you know, there's other uh, regulatory agencies that could stop or slow down the project for whatever reason. EPA has their own share of, of regulations and um, uh, and, and so do we. Um, so, so not just arbitrarily stopping a project, uh, but we, we definitely, and it's almost all of them are, are case, case by case situations. Um, doing a lot of research here, you know, we, you know, when we have permits that come through our office, it, it takes time to have our guys research and see what's there, see, look at the surveys, the previous surveys, the area of potential effect. Um, there's a lot of things that go into play uh, before we, we do any type of allowances, um, you know, and, and what we don't want to do is, is, is have those, some people avoid those, uh, from, from, a from a permitting process because they don't want to pay or what have you and just clear their, their properties without the government knowing, um, that's really a tough one for us to swallow, um, while we continue to, to put regulations on, on other bigger entities. So, um, again, you know, there, there's some ideas that, 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 that we can talk on, 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 on another meeting that probably can, can allow me to have a little bit more teeth in the law um, in order to, to do an across-the-board uh, cultural preservation stance. Yeah, I'm sure I'm, uh, I'm very open to that and my colleagues. Uh, sorry, Senator Therese? Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, um, Julie Faye, Victoria, Maria, for your testimony, and of course the doctors are, that are present. But yeah, um, as to working together, I very much agree with that. I think it is overwhelming for everyone. It's, um, and I think it's overwhelming by design. I really believe that. And I think that, uh, you know, it's always been my hope and my work that the government has to, you know, carry some of this burden for the people because, um, you know, we, we have the resources or we should have the resources to do that. But the number one most important thing, and I, I just want to really reemphasize this is is we have to share the information. If we're if the information only gets shared with the military archaeologists or parts of the Shippo's office, it does none of us any good. And it and that's not what it's for. It's not for somebody's scientific um, resume. It's never. It should never be for that. It should be for when we know. Then we as leaders can help inform the people of it which is what we're trying to do by these hearings and we've had many many and uh, good information has come out but you know so much more can be done but yeah i want i i just have to re-emphasize that it doesn't belong to any one leader this information doesn't belong to the governor the legislature it belongs to all of the tomorrow people it belongs to all of us here on guam and the sooner that we can learn of it we can work together. We can. We have done this in the past. We have backed up the shippo when necessary. We've backed each other up um, when necessary. We've advocated to the governor. 
and given her, you know, all the cover that, you know, to, to stop these projects that are going to be, you know, digging up burial grounds or removing, you know, the last remaining tree, in, you know, of a, a certain species and just really ups, um, disturbing our, our ancient grounds, um, ancient homelands. That's, I think we just have to continue to commit to work together and do that as much as we can. So I want to thank all of you for your hard work. And it, uh, the community has really, really um, been the leaders, I would have to say. You know, uh, the group, all of the people who submitted testimony on these uh, EISs and the SEISs on the various projects, all of the groups that participated in the negotiations on the programmatic agreement and that was extensive and then who you know um, um, were not included in the end and then all the people and I've received a lot of comments in my office from uh, constituents show, uh, sending us their input on these programmatic agreement memos so I, I want to thank you for for that and uh, that continues to inspire all of us to continue to work together. So, um, yeah, let's not give up. Let's just work harder. And I think, you know, while we've still got it in us, we can make progress. And uh, we're seeing some progress. It's slow, but we are seeing a little. Thank you. All right, thank you, Senator Therese. I'm sorry, I just want to allow for um, Ms. Joni Kerr to provide testimony. I didn't want to leave her out. Okay, um, <clears throat> I'll try to hurry up. <laughs> um, I'm Joni King Kerr. I teach introductory chemistry and marine biology at Guam Community College. I'm also a faculty advisor for the GCC Eco Warriors, which is a student and community organization committed to protecting Guam's natural resources. I'm here to provide testimony regarding environmental concerns about the live fire training range. Um, and the lack of environmental updates from the military. I have to uh, uh, say that I'm not an expert on limestone hydrology um, or the listed species affected by um, the limestone forest being cleared, but I think I can communicate what are valid concerns that I don't think have been satisfactorily, satisfactorily addressed by the military. Uh, the firing range site overlies the Finnegadzen and Agafagumas basins of the Northern Guam Lens Aquifer. And these are significant sources of our drinking water. I'm concerned about how the military will ensure that our drinking water will not be affected by heavy metals such as lead, antimony, copper, and zinc. Um, I'm gonna read a few lines from an article that came out of a journal called Military Medicine. It was published in 2016 and it is called Lead Exposure in Military Outdoor Firing Ranges. Now, admittedly, this article was, was primarily looking at uh, physiological uh, buildup of lead contaminants in, in humans, um, people exposed to firing ranges in, in the US military. But um, some of the text does touch on um, how the lead and heavy metals might get into the environment. So um, in 2012, the US lead production was estimated at 69,000 metric tons. Uh, and for ammunition, that constitutes about 5% of the annual national production. So much of that production of lead finds its way into firing ranges, uh, which have long been recognized as potential sources of lead exposure. Lead exposure occurs mainly through inhalation of lead fume and dust, skin contact with lead from bullets or ingestion. Um, I'm really concerned about lead dust, aerosolization of um, lead uh, produced by uh, the firing of, of the ammunition. Um, so um, the outdoor ranges, uh, these apparently need less cleaning, less maintenance compared to indoor ranges. But because they are in open areas, lead and other contaminants are more widely dispersed. Um, they can get into the air, the soil, and uh, into the groundwater. Um, so uh, admittedly, these firing ranges are variable in temperature, humidity, and wind velocity. But um, these factors can affect 
um, how that lead gets airborne and dispersed when uh, shooting is, can, is going on. Uh, the military has stated that monitoring and groundwater sampling will occur, but I'm concerned that monitoring and sampling, while that, that is necessary, um, I don't think that's sufficient. Uh, the final SEIS of July 2015 does state that lead deposited on a range can become environmentally active if the right combination of conditions exist. I didn't see any reference to what those right com combination of conditions were, but I can just um, assume that what they might be talking about is heavy winds, heavy rain. Um, as to my knowledge, the military has no preventative plan to decrease the amount of heavy metals uh, before a significant amount makes its way into the environment. Um, I said before, lead dust can be airborne and uh, uh, then, so you've got heavy winds and rain that can um, act as dispersants. Um, I'm worried that it will get into the soil. It will percolate through the limestone and into the groundwater. I'm also concerned that what occurs on the cliff line will affect the reef, especially um, or specifically the potential for heavy metals to be transported by percolation or even by wind, carried by wind, um, over the cliff into the water into the coastline and the reef. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the limestone forest uh, that was removed for the firing range. Um, the destruction of the high quality pristine limestone forest in Tailalu adds to the loss of one of the most endangered forest types in the world. While the military pursues their forest enhancement project as a replacement for the lost forest, they will never be able to replicate nature's project that took millions of years to create. Further, the destruction of our natural resources increases our people's disconnection with their tano, around which our ancestral cultural heritage was founded and developed. So according to today, today's Pacific Daily News, part of the firing range is nearly 50% on its way to completion. I am not aware of any environmental updates posted by the military regarding removal and transplantation of endangered plant species such as the Cycas micronesica, which we call fadeng, um, or the host plants for the Mariana eight-spot butterfly. Um, there are nine other species that were designated by um, the US Fish and Wildlife Service biological opinion um, they were designated as ones that may be affected and likely to be adversely affected. And I'm gonna, um, I guess I'm really concerned real about the CICAD uh, situation um, and the host plant, the butterfly host plants. So it should be known that the, that the forest in Tailalo had the largest population of eight spot butterflies on the island. That was generally known about amongst the biologists that survey for the butterflies. Um, the host plants play such a critical role in the eight spot butterfly life cycle, um, but they were supposed to be moved from an area where most of the butterflies are were found to an area where very few butterflies are found. I guess in the hopes that the butterflies are gonna follow the host plants. So we haven't had any update on this removal and transplantation or translocation of these host plants. Um, given the speed with which clearing for the live fire training range has been performed and the controversy raised by the clearing of cultural sites for the marine base, it's interesting that we haven't had any, any information about the, this translocation. Um, another translocation, uh, translocated species is the cycad. Uh, it was supposed, the military was supposed to be, um, was committed to moving 1,596 uh, CICAD individuals, either as a whole plant or as a, a basal sucker. It's a, um, how can I describe this? They, they're called pups. Um, they're a part of the plant that you can remove and then, um, and that, but you have to grow them in a certain way in a certain location for them to, to reach maturity. And there's a special way that that has to be done. 
So the military was committed to taking 1,596 of those individuals, taking care of them. So uh, we haven't heard anything about it. Um, so pursuant to the one Guam policy, I think that transparency with regard to environmental concerns is necessary and critical to the relationship between Guam's residents and the military. Sidhu's Masi, thank you. Uh, thank, thank you so much, Miss um, Kerr. Um, so uh, my office did reach out to US Fish and Wildlife Service to get an update on the mitigation projects. Um, supposedly the Department of Defense is supposed to send an annual report about the mitigation process. In my conversation, um, they said that they are not engaged in field monitoring to determine if mitigation projects are being accomplished. So there is a, a, a gap. And so that to me is, goes against what Endangered Species Act is supposed to do. And US Fish and Wildlife Service, their responsibility, it goes against what their responsibility is, is to ensure um, the perpetuation of these endangered species. Um, it's, it's very concerning to me that um, there is no follow through. And the information that you are, are seeking uh, is, is in you know, very you know, private hands. And um, you know, I think that's something that my office is gonna to continue to seek is more monitoring and oversight of these things, just as we need to seek more uh, protection and preservation of our cultural resources. Uh, and regards to the lead dust, uh, we do have Walter Leon Guerrero uh, on the on the line. I know, sorry, Senator Kelly, is it okay if we have him uh, at least address some of the issues with the um, with um, contamination? So, uh, so Walter, you are familiar with contaminated sites on base, and um, we have a report as far as the public, uh, even with the Guam legislature, that South Finnegansen had high levels of radon um, that were, that are uh, harmful to human health. Um, and are you, I, I know there's, uh, you are gonna provide some documentation, but as far as the location, are you familiar where, where this location is, uh, where there was high levels of radon in the Finnegansen area? And I guess I'm also wondering if this is one of the reasons why they chose not to, to build their headquarters in a, a disturbed area and put it in an area where there was um, no measurement of contamination. Thank you, Senator. Um, first off, uh, again, I want to just remind everyone, radon is a naturally occurring gas that uh, that, that, gets, that can get captured into uh, buildings and facilities that uh, prevent it from venting out. Uh, with that being said, there was a study done by DOD uh, for the South Finnegan housing area. That study was showed elevated levels of radon. Um, what DOD did was they, they mitigated the housing, they corrected it at, uh, to a normal level. And then at that point, um, for reasons I do not know, I uh, wasn't just one of was in an air program too, I wasn't the administrator. They demolished the housing there. Um, as far as the plans and where they decide where they're going to build, I don't. Again, as the government of Guam, Guam EPA administrator currently, I don't know what why the reason why they didn't put buildings where they did. Um, I can only speak to the information I know, um, which is again, there was elevated radon levels within the housing areas. Yes. In regards to permitting of firing ranges, is, is Guam EPA involved with any of that, of the permitting process? Yes, yes, ma'am. Uh, we have, um, we are one of the few agencies that actually permits um, construction inside the fence line. And our, our, our permitting uh, requirements fall under everybody, uh, which, you know, includes like some of the water division, we have sediment and erosion control, we have water resource development and operating regulations, we have underground injection control regulations, uh, and uh, the list goes on, and it would probably be better if I provide them to you guys in a written form, and I apologize, I did not do that already. Uh, but yes, for the ranges, we do um, uh, oversee 
uh, the permitting process. And part of that permitting process is our attempt to make sure that, uh, especially for ranges, lead contamination does not get into our sole source aquifer. Um, but for those that know me, they know I'm an avid uh, believer in preventing as much as possible, getting any type of contamination or any pathway into our sole source aquifer. Unfortunately, due to our geology and hydrogeology, that venue exists because we have karst uh, fractalized limestone, which gives the opportunity from anything being spilt on the top of, you know, on surf ground surface to have an opportunity to almost go directly into it, which we have some dietary studies that show that information. Um, so we still follow the guidelines that we have in our regulatory authority. Um, we have to, we cannot overstep those guidelines. And I can say that we are currently and will continue to administer the regulations as we are allowed per for the regulations themselves. Okay, so um, Ms. Kerr mentioned something about that uh, with the right conditions, the lead can become radioactive. Is that what you said? Environmentally mm -hmm. active. Um, oh, it can be become environmentally active. So, um, <laughs> so let's say that it it's in the air, and um, apparently it can exist uh, according to one source about 10 days, depending on the mm -hmm. form it's in, but I'm guessing uh, fine dust. Um, so uh, um, if the right conditions exist, then, uh, and I'm thinking rain, wind, um, it can disperse. Um, yeah, so, and, and become environmentally active. Right, so, so uh, part of uh, the term environment and being, being active uh, is having lead it be uh, leachable into, so that it may affect our groundwater. Um, so some of the things that we are looking to prevent that is having a, a, a regularly scheduled cleanup of the, of the future um, iron ranges so that the lead does not have the time, the long time to sit and be able to saturate the ground. Um, we also are potentially, um, for the aerosol issue, that's, that one's a little bit more difficult because the aerosol issue, is, as Mrs. Kerr had pointed out, is when they shoot their firearms, whether it be a machine gun or whatever, right? Heavy artillery armor, that's when it's released. Um, if, and uh, to be honest with you, I, I need to do more homework on that and see what we can do to prevent that. I know like for indoor ranges, they have filters um, so that the, the lead's not released into the atmosphere. For outdoor ranges, I'm not too sure. I, and, and I will take whatever you guys um, want to throw at me because I don't know. I need to check with my air program. I need to check with our regional counterparts to ensure what we can do for to ensure that uh, lead that is being released into the air can be controlled from outdoor uh, firing range. Um, so we, we try to address the, the soil, potential soil contamination efforts by having them, or will having them do uh, regularly um, cleanups of the ranges. Uh, it's the aerosol part. We may have put a stipulation, I just need to make sure and understand why we did. Um, again, I do not know personally. Uh, I do know that this agency will find out and will we'll make this a requirement if we have not already. So again, I apologize for me not knowing uh, the information, but uh, I'd rather be honest and straightforward with you guys at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. But just to give you a context, um, the, the, the operation is going to uh, estimate it to to shoot six, almost 7 million bullets, well, 6.7 million bullets over 273 days of the year. So that's, that, that's, a, lot, a, that's a huge uh, exposure, uh, potential mm -hmm. exposure to blood. But yeah, we'll, we'll definitely reach out to you and to get more of that 
hard facts. Yeah. Um, so I, again, I, I could, I'm sorry, Senator, but you know there are some there are some current uh, live firing ranges currently. Um, not all DOD, and as far as I recall, we don't have any um, air requirement. And again, this is something that. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Kerr. I really need to look into to see if there's something that we can do to address that. Um, but I know currently we don't have anything as as we as we sit here now. Which includes, uh, you know, the local firing range that we have in Minigal. Uh, just one question before I turn it over to Senator Marsh. Um, so, do all ranges have to have an environmental impact statement prior to the permitting? That's that is correct. We we try to make the yes, we make them have submit that. Um, but not it's not a requirement, but we ask for that, uh, especially for the larger ranges. Um, Currently, our, our guidelines and our policies for ranges is we, um, it's more, it's more, it's more to protect the owner and the operator of the landfill um, uh, because, you know, we, we, we regulate it as a business for, for private entities. And um, when we do that, they have to, you know, we, again, we monitor to ensure that there's no, um, contamination going through the groundwater through some monitoring wells and, uh, and other mechanisms. But still when the land, when the, when the range closes, that's when our full scope of uh, ability to oversee uh, any potential need for cleanup. And that's currently how we're operating right now. And I know that's not the best answer to give, but that's, that's what we're doing now. So, um, yeah. All right, um, thank you, uh, Walter. Um, so I'd like to open the floor back to Senator Marsh Titano. I appreciate you uh, for your patience. Jesus Masi for uh, bringing it back to me. So let's see. Um, so I was largely talking about the community input and uh, the, the different the different ways that it is and isn't working at the same uh, because of the programmatic agreement and where we're at with trying to get those public comments. In. So with that, um, I was looking at a section and I think this is one of the issues that we're dealing with is when we're looking at Indian tribes and Native Hawaiian organizations, that they are entitled to consult on undertakings no matter where they are because of religious and cultural significance to them. And I think it's one of the situations within the US that gets lost in areas like Guahan or Guam where you do have also an indigenous peoples, but because the US doesn't have like a minimum requirement or standard that says if there are indigenous people that they, they automatically are part of this, um, it, it creates these situations where certain peoples will get left out. And so with that, like I said, we know that for Indian tribes and Native Hawaiian organizations, they are part of the process in ways that perhaps tomorrow's or others who are here on Guam are not as, as readily so. And so in putting these different thoughts together about whether interested parties are indeed sought after by the federal entity, um, because section 106 is involved when it's any federal entity, right? Or, or, um, or these kind of situations for indigenous peoples that perhaps in looking for some answers, we could work at it from one angle, as I mentioned, having one or more entities, maybe the military affairs, maybe also with the, the SHPO working together to walk the community through this community input process to make sure that it works better. Um, along with the federal partners, it's uh, by and large, it's their, 
it's their responsibility to be building data, but also perhaps to be building a permanent council to represent Guam concerns and or tomorrow concerns, however, that would want to be looked at as a default interested party, that they would always be our interested party that would be looking into these sort of things, right? So that it wouldn't necessarily have to be um, the situation where people think, well, there is no interested party. We would always have them be involved as an interested party. And then if it needs to build beyond that to particular landowners, particular families, particular uh, companies, whoever might have a stake in the situation, then it could be expanded beyond that. Um, so those are some of the ideas I'm, I'm interested in pursuing either through this annual workshop um, and di further discussions with the Historic Preservation Office, the Military Affairs Office and others. But I think also we do need to pursue this, this idea of those, for lack of a better term, fallow areas that are, are sitting there. And if South Finnegodson is sitting there unused, it may be because it has those high level of radon. Um, I had heard something about that too, that the houses themselves uh, had been problematic and, and, and they were bulldozed. But um, figuring out a way to better push for using those sorts of areas. There are several that I know of military housing areas that are sitting around unused and, and yet we have pristine and secondary limestone forests being bulldozed. And, that equation doesn't seem to be correct. And I'm glad to hear that there's this uh, gathering together and, and energizing each other. I think that's part of what's important about hearings like this is that we're here to show that we're working together, we're concerned together, and we can be stronger together. There are certain things that haven't come up and, and I'd like to make sure that we do, whether it's through the SHPO or we as leaders, but certain things that that have worked elsewhere could have worked here. They're in American Samoa. They are building indoor ranges, maybe not for all, but for some of their firing ranges. If that had even been part of what they did here, it would have cut down the impacts to our fishers the impacts to sacred sites, the impacts to our waterlands, um, the impacts from you know, so many of these concerns that we've expressed today. And so I, I urge all of us to, to do our part in pushing for these things. We know that they can do them. This is a military firing range in American Samoa. They are an island as well. So we need to be here for each other and push for those things because apparently they're not going to volunteer them. And we need to be protecting the community. That's really what it's all about. It's not just to say it. It's because these resources, 90, 80 to 90 percent of our water comes from the freshwater lens up north. That fishing area off of La Texan is one of our our best fishing areas. It's an ancestral fishing area. All of these things are worth protecting. And so we need to be gathering together and promoting these things that possibly they look at at least partly indoor ranges and other things that we know that are, are occurring elsewhere or have the potential of, of occurring elsewhere so that our environment is not so heavily impacted, so heavily um, just negatively impacted. As was stated earlier, we don't know if those butterflies will go. A forest like this to make up for the forest that's being bulldozed has never been done before. We don't know that there's what the success will be. There is a huge loss rate when that forest is disassembled and then they try to reassemble parts of it. We 
do, if you look at the biological opinion, there are predicted 20 to 50 or more percent losses of what was already standing. So um, along with uh, Senator Sabina and Senator Therese and all the experts here, it just, I, I also really appreciate your knowledge and your ability to inform us of, of what the potential is and, and ways that we could be pushing for something that helps us better protect what is rather than what is going to be destroyed and maybe can be uh, to some degree reinstated somewhere else because once these things are gone from where they are that pristine limestone forest the ancestral heritage the historic sites they can't ever be put back they it, they just can't it, the environment will never be the same and those sites will never be the same so um, I do thank everybody here, and I especially thank the senators for having this joint informational hearing. I think it's done a lot of really important things. So, Sidhuis um, Mahasi, I'll go ahead and just leave it at that. So, this can, I, can I say something? Um, I, I noticed that, that Mrs. Keller uh, put something on the chat uh, in regard to radon. <coughs> Excuse me. So, yes. Um, Part of the regular mitigation of radon is to uh, vent it uh, from homes, um, especially our homes or offices, specific buildings and, and whatnot. Um, there's a way to do that for existing uh, facilities and buildings. I do know that the military has already gone that uh, any future buildings will have the uh, passive mitigation system for radon in place. Uh, and that's part of their construction um, requirements. Um, so uh, again, if we're asking why they're not building their offices over potential radon uh, impacted areas, um, I don't have an answer for that. I do know that the military already in their building designs have passive remediation, radon remediation systems in place. So I can say that uh, and I do want to say um, this. Uh, I, I don't know what I sound like as far as uh, my, my personal position. I'm trying to keep this as impartial uh, as the administrator got me pay for what the regulations that we have. And uh, if, if you ask me when I'm wearing this hat, I can give you my personal opinion. So that, with that, I just wanted to let you guys know that, yes, um, radon is something that can be mitigated even prior to the buildings being fully built, and, and that is being addressed by DOD. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Walter. Yeah, it just I think it's really odd that we use the word mitigation for preceding area and our, our historic sites. And what we really should be mitigating is the um, contamination. I think that's where we should really mitigate and really we need to stay away from you know, the, these areas. And I just also want to point to a study that was done uh, by Boyd Dixon. Um, he was actually looking at the makeup of the forest as a means to study agriculture of, of the Laddie, Laddie settlement. Um, he was looking at the soil, but I think there is still a lot that is unknown regarding forest itself and its makeup and, and as it pertains to uh, cultural sites. So I'm really, um, I'm sure Dr. Carson, you, I don't know if you actually looked into that as far as the, um, the forest makeup as a way to understand the agricultural uh, aspects. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll try to be brief. We, I, I always can provide more information later. I understand this getting late for everyone. But yeah, yes, in, in, indeed, you can look at uh, the current forest, but also look at forest uh, succession over time and look at indicators in, uh, in the soil itself and uh, residues clinging to ancient artifacts and, and sort of reconstruct uh, the, the bits and pieces of, of the natural history and how they related with, with the archaeology. And 
extremely important work. Um, we have done quite a bit of that actually, uh, specifically in Guam. Uh, and as I mentioned before, the, the, what we look at as, as natural resources, such as trees, water resources, um, limestone forest, they are cultural resources. Yeah, every, everyone listening to this knows, knows that already, but that, that sentiment does not necessarily come across in the US government language. So I, I would hope we can, we can just find a way to work on that. I believe everyone on this call is on the same page on, on that topic. But uh, hopefully, can work together to to put put that forward in, in a way that has impact in, in the government language. All right. So thank you so much, Dr. Carson, and I want to thank everybody here today uh, for being here and providing your expert testimony, um, both in the government and in the community. Uh, I think I, it's nice to see that the, the people in the community just have, you know, have very valuable viewpoints to present. Um, I also want to uh, allow Senator. Shalahi, if she wants to provide any parting words, I know we have to head on to a, a budget hearing. Very quickly, just want to say thank you again. It's very hard work to, to continue to stay up on all of this information and to help spread it. And to and uh, we are very fortunate to have experts in our midst who can inform us and that we don't have to rely on only one side to be informed. It's very disappointing when we go on the floor and we try to have debates and some people will tell us, can we get more information from other experts? And uh, when you have made yourselves available, and I, I wanna thank you for that again. So uh, we'll continue to share this information. That's our biggest uh, service I think that we can do right now. Thank you, Sitos Masi. Sitos Masi uh, to everyone that's here and, uh, and we'll look forward to uh, really uh, recent future discussions. Um, Regarding what what are the next steps so I appreciate everybody's contribution all right thank you very much um, and as of uh, the time is now 446 uh, this joint information hearing is now um, adjourned Just